Creativity episode 111. Oh, it gives me the heebie-jeebies to just even say it. Midnight Mass on Netflix. Here we go with our host, V. Hey, Biff. How you doing, man? I'm doing okay, V. How are you? Fine, fine. Uh, so, uh, do anything interesting over the weekend? Well, I spent three days making the bar bigger for you three drunk assholes. But, uh, other than that, nope. Just watch this thing that you made me watch, the Midnight Mass. And how'd you like it? Oh, it was a good one. Okay, well, uh, are you a churchgoer, Biff? Uh, no. Uh, the last time I went, uh, the last time I walked into a church, I made the local exorcist faint. Yep. Been there. Okay, so we're going to go on here with Midnight Mass. Um, this show is created by Mike Flanagan. And uh, I was not familiar with this guy. Uh, I kind of moved away from, you know, this is going to be a spoiler, people. I do spoilers. and so, But the type of spoiler I'm doing for this one, I'm not going to spoil anything that happens like in Episode 7 when I'm talking about Episode one. So if you've only watched the first five episodes, let's say you can stop and come back and listen to the rest. But um, I really like this show a lot. Uh, you know, at first when I saw it, I thought, uh, you know, there's like a lot of um, Christian productions being done now. And that's fine. You know, there's an audience for it, of course. So I thought, I'm like, eh, you know, and I just kind of whizzed past it a few times and Excuse me, I had to drink some coffee. I was past it a few times and was like, eh, Midnight Mass, whatever. And then I was bored one day and pretty much watched all the stuff that came out last month. And uh, I looked a little closer and I'm like, wait a minute, that's Hamish. Click on the click on the uh, thumbnail and sure enough, Hamish Linklater was in it. And I usually, when I see if he's in something, I will watch it because he... Uh, He's always good in what he does, and uh, at least I've always uh, enjoyed the movies and stuff and TV shows or whatever he's done. Whatever I've seen him in, I can't recall a whole list of them, but I've always enjoyed his work. So I tend to, you know, do that, as most people do. But, uh, and also, once I saw Henry Thomas, who played uh, Elliot in uh, E.T., I... uh, I knew I definitely had to watch it because I've been watching the stuff that he's been doing. And uh, I worked on a flick with him one time, but I wasn't on set, unfortunately. I was off set doing stuff. But, uh, yeah, so the director and uh, the writer or co-writer for every episode is uh, Mike Flanagan. And that makes a huge difference, man, when you have one writer who's just throughout the whole thing. And, you know, a lot of these TV shows that used to be on... Back in the old days, you don't need 22, 24, 20, whatever episodes to tell a story. Because what happens is a lot of them wind up being trash because you're always on the treadmill and bang, bang, bang. Actors get worn out, this, that, and the other. You know what? You can tell shorter stories, better stories, and take out all the shit, you know? So, anyway. So, I stopped on this. And, of course, you know... um, I'm involved with a book called Reboot Jesus that's coming out in December. And uh, so I like when things relating to religion are flipped or talked about or cut open to discuss uh, just because, uh, you know, after all, it's all about the story, isn't it? Anyway, so, uh, so I'd gone away from the horror genre, I don't know, Mm, I mean, my my sons were into it when they were smaller. Uh, my one, uh, the youngest, really got into horror movie, and he collected, like, all the different Michael Myers masks and all the, the Freddy Krueger looks and all the, you know, he could tell you what mold there are, what movie they came from, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's kind of cool since, you know, the, the place I worked at did uh, the Friday the 13th movies and the Nightmare on Elm Street back in the day. And I even worked on a, a few... Well, quite a few low budget horror movies back when low budget horror, even though they were bad, they were good. It seems uh, the newer, like B movie on purpose movies, just 
suck. You know, the digital camera, yeah, you can do more and blah, blah, blah. But it, I don't know. There's just, you know, you can watch something like Basket Case from the 80s or, you know, pick, you know, I Spit on Your Grave, whatever it is. Pick these old crappy horror movies that are really good because they're crappy, but they're good crappy, you know. But anyway, so uh, so I'd gone away from horror, and I didn't know, um, you know, I didn't know that this was horror based when it start when it started, and uh, that's pretty much the only spoiler I'm going to do up front. But um, yeah, so okay, so. I turn it on, and it's about basically what what this show is about. It's, uh, okay, the series is about a small, isolated island community whose existing divisions are amplified by the return of a disgraced young man and the arrival of a charismatic priest. So basically, this dude gets in trouble, goes to jail, killed someone in like a DUI type of situation, and, uh, you know, he went to jail. He was like a commodities trader, like hotshot Wall Street guy. And basically he has to go home for some reason after prison because whatever, he's got no other options at the time. So he's going home and to this island with like, I don't know, I think there's like a 136, 126 people living on this island supposedly. And it all revolves around, you know, everything is the church, you know. So uh, that's kind of like the setting of it. So... Island, desolation, um, you know, not too many people. Church has the, um, has the basically rules the island with a uh, kind of a iron fist due to this bitch Bev, this Bev character that's in here. She's a fucking piece of work. Um, but she kind of like, you know, influences a lot that goes on and, She's the person who, you know, like takes care of the, the Monsignor, the, who was the older priest, and this and the other, take, takes care of the church, does all the, all the business stuff, and, you know, basically everything that the priest does not she handles. I don't know if by choice or just by imposing herself, but uh, that's kind of what she does, you know. So, yeah, so I wasn't familiar with Mike Flanagan at all, and uh, apparently he's done... You know, quite, I've, I mean, I've heard of the movies he's done. Like, I've heard, um, you know, The Haunting of Bly Manor. Um, I've heard of Hush. I've heard of Oculus. But I never watched his stuff because it was in... So, after watching this, I'm going to watch everything that this guy's done that I can find. Just because I really enjoy his uh, his writing style. And uh, definitely the way, the way he directs and tells the story. Uh, and that's why... We choose to watch stuff because we want to be entertained by the story, not always by flash and razzmatazz. But uh, anyway, so his coming, his miniseries that are coming up, uh, he's doing one called The Midnight Club, where he directs and writes, and he created, uh, and he is writing and directing uh, a six part miniseries on the fall of the House of Usher. So it's going to be really cool to see what he does with that one. Um, it's just so good. Okay, so let's go through the cast. So, the cast starts with Kate Siegel, not Katie Siegel, from Married with Children and Sons of Anarchy fame, but Kate Siegel as Aaron Green, Riley's childhood sweetheart, who is now a school teacher on Crockett Island and expecting a child. So, Riley is the guy who I was talking to earlier. Okay, so then we have Zach Gifford as Riley Flynn, a former venture capitalist who returns to his hometown of Crockett Island after spending four years in prison for killing a woman in a drunk driving accident. And uh, by the way, all this stuff is uh, coming right off of um, Wikipedia because they usually have this stuff in order here. So I'm just reading off to you. Uh, Christine Lehman as Annie Flynn, Riley's devout forgiving mother. Samantha Sloyan as Beeve Kin. Beeve Keen, sorry. A zealous and overbearing member of St. Patrick's Church and an influ uh, influential figure in the community. Comma. 
total fucking bitch. That's what they should put at the end of it. And people are like, oh my God, you can't say that. Oh my God, you can't say... Watch the show. I'm, and I'm being nice, okay? Um, really good job by her, by the way. Uh, Samantha did an amazing job on making such a hateful, fucking ignorant person. Uh, Igby Rigney is Warren Flynn, Riley's teenage brother who serves as an altar boy at the church. Then we have some other people. We have a... Uh, Raul Coley is Sheriff Hassan. This guy, I've seen him in so he was in something else, and he fucking knocked it out. He played it really good. Uh, Crockett's Island Muslim sheriff who finds it difficult to fit in with the town's predominantly Christian population. Now there's a really good realistic um, argument that happens with the community leaders, and it's fucking spot on because if you're not part of the majority it's very funny how quick people turn into total fucking assholes when you're not part of the majority and they want to impose their dominion over you because they think that they can't possibly be fucking wrong which you know what that means they're fucking wrong anyway sorry then we have uh we have annabeth gish as dr sarah gunning the town's local doctor and aaron's closest friend uh, Annabeth is always good in whatever she does. Um, if I'd have just seen that she was doing it by herself and I didn't see the other people, I would have clicked on it just as well. Alex Esso is Mildred Gunning, Sarah's aging mother who has dementia. And let's see. Oh, Henry Thomas is Ed Flynn. Riley's father works as a fisherman and is reluctant to welcome his son home. It's kind of like old school, uh, you know. Anyway, so Hamish Linklater... Plays P- Father Paul Hill, the enigmatic new priest at St. Patrick's Church who arrives to replace the aging Monsignor Pruitt temporarily. Okay, so here we go. Episode number one. Book one, Genesis, directed by Mike Flanagan, written by Mike Flanagan. Riley F- Flynn returns to his home of Crockett Island, a tiny offshore fishing village, after serving four years for a drunk driving crash that killed a young woman. Having lost his faith during his incarnation, Riley struggles to reintegrate with the town's devout Catholic community, which includes his parents, Annie and Ed, teenage brother Warren, childhood sweetheart Aaron Green, who has returned on Crockett Island pregnant and is now working as a school teacher, zealous parishioner Beeve Keen, and Father Paul Hill, a newcomer who is temporarily replacing the aging man Senior Pruitt, whose whereabouts only Father Paul seems to know. The town is reeling economically after an oil spill that crippled its fishing industry. While out at night to drink and smoke marijuana with his friends, Uker and Allie, Warren spots strange movement in a remote island area populated by feral cats, which are later mauled by an unseen entity. The following night, Riley sees the figure of Monsignor Pruitt walking along the beach amidst a raging storm. But the figure soon vanishes. The next morning, hundreds of dead cats are discovered along the beach. Now, all those cats killed in this thing, I was like, that's pretty funny. And people are like, oh my god, you can't say that about cats. Yes, you can. You can joke. Fucking release the stick. I don't mean real cats. No real cats were killed. But what's funny, because you aren't going to put anything in context context anyway if you're going to bitch about it. (laughs) Uh, Anyway, so what's funny about it is every horror show, I talked about this on Saturday night with Jason and uh, Rob, every horror show had that one fucking moment where you're really into what's going on and the fucking cat (laughs) fucking scares the shit out of you. Fuck that cat. So that's all those cats. That are lying on that thing. I think that's actually an inside joke for people who are huge horror fans. But, you know, I'm sure they're going to be, you know, bitching about it somewhere. But, uh, yeah, it was re- I was really good. Uh, you know, so everyone's like, who's this new, you know, who's this new uh, young uh, priest that's coming in? Everyone's like, oh, my God, you know, where's Monsignor? And what they did is they actually sent him over to Jerusalem on a pilgrimage. But the guy's like 80 and he was suffered from dementia. So they sent this guy who shouldn't have gone by himself overseas to um, 
you know, have his pilgrimage and blah, blah, blah. Okay. So, and then basically he caught ill and uh, went into a, you know, you think he went into a home or something just by the way that they're talking about it. And he's filling in quote unquote temporarily wink. And, uh, you know, Riley Flynn, uh, he's a really good, uh, he, he's very, a very angsty looking dude. So when he plays angst, it locks in pretty good. And uh, he had really good uh, chemistry with um, uh, uh, Aaron Green, uh, Kate uh, Siegel, who, by the way, is my new celebrity crush. Wow. When she walks on screen, the world kind of stops. And she's quite good, so I'm not just being a dick. Um, she is quite talented. Okay, so let's go to book two. And by the way, this is going to be shorter than a normal podcast because there's only seven episodes. So, you know, not doing 90 minutes, probably do 45 or something. And I just wanted to squeak one out because I want to do the follow-up, which was uh, Halloween Kills. And uh, I'm going to review that and talk about that on the next one. And then uh, Saturday, we'll be back with uh, Creativity Talking. I think uh, we're gonna creativity is gonna be talking guitar players or uh, probably some more Halloween stuff, and then uh, you know we'll go from there. But anyway, creativity is sponsored by VaudevillePress.com. Check there for more content from creativity. Creativity talking. Situation unknown. The upcoming Vito Bupkis book. The Book of Vito Bupkis and Reboot Jesus coming out December 6th. Vaudeville Press, where the world is your stage. Anyway, so getting back to Kate Siegel, um, she has really, really good um, on screen chemistry with this guy. And uh, every, this cast is amazing. I mean, no one, you know, no one, you know, it doesn't seem like there's any stunt casting. You know, like um, uh, the older lady, I'm, I looked, I had to do a double. I'm like, why are they, Why is she an um, elderly, was she, why is she in aging makeup? You know, basically she was wrinkled. She didn't, you know, there, there was one thing, they should have put contacts in her rather than, anyway, but uh, that was the only thing that kind of, I like, hmm, interesting. But there's a reason why you focused on that person who was supposed to be really not, quote-unquote, important to the overall. But we will continue. So, episode two, called Book Two, Psalms. Directed by Mike Flanagan. Written by Mike Flanagan. James Flanagan and Elon Gale. Okay, so the townsfolk cannot determine the cause of death with the cats lying along the beach. Then the douchebag um, mayor comes around. He's like, oh, and, you know, has some whatever cra crazy kind of thing. And they're like, hey, let's burn these cats. You know, basically, you know, because of their disease, at least they can get rid of the, the disease that they have. Anyway, so Bev covers the church perimeter with 1080, which is a, to fend off potential predators, which is a poison of some kind. You know, basically she had said something about, you know, rat, you know, killing the rats or whatever, getting, you know. So Father Paul learns that Lisa Scarborough, the Crockett's mayor's daughter who uses a wheelchair, the douchebag's daughter, was paraly paralyzed after being accidentally sh shot um, by the town drunk Joe Collins during the island's annual Ash Wednesday Potluck Festival. Joe's dog suddenly dies after eating food off the ground. Joe suspects Bev, whom he personally despises for extracting church donations from the townsfolk after convincing them to accept a settlement from the oil company that poisoned the bay's waters, knowing it would all benefit the church. Aaron witnesses a mysterious creature stalking through her property. Riley attends a one-on-one -on -one AA meeting with Father Paul, where he expresses his contempt for the doctrine of th uh, theology, owning his guilt. Oh, sorry, owning to bleh, owning to his guilt over the fatal car accident that he had caused. 
Uh, during Mass that Sunday, Father Paul insists that Lisa rise from her wheelchair to accept the Eucharist. To everyone's shock, Lisa stands and walks. Okay, so let's go through this. Okay, so the town drunk's like, you know, is yelling, Bev, you did, you know, and Bev's just sitting there like acting innocent, and you know she fucking killed the dog because she's a fucking tool. Anyway, so uh, it, it starts cre- creating this thing on basically everyone, you know, the world should hate Bev because she's just an evil, you know, uh, evil do-gooder hiding behind the Bible. Like, we've all seen those people. But, uh, yeah, so so basically there was this huge lawsuit that happened and, uh, you know, and everyone got a settlement uh, from the oil company, and then they basically, you know, some people didn't like Bev because she's, you know, basically guilted them into giving the church more than they, you know, more than they needed. But, you know, you put the guilt of the Lord behind it, and all of a sudden, anyway. So there's this weird, like, creature kind of weird thing where uh, Aaron witnesses this creature in her property. And not really sure what the hell it is, you know. And uh, Father Paul was cool enough because Riley had to go via ferry into the mainland every time he had to do an AA meeting. He'd do a bunch of them, so he'd always be. So it would waste like half his week going to and from this AA. Not, not waste, but it would waste a lot of his time because it was ferry and then walking, you know, bus walk, da 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 and where he could just do it in the church and he didn't have to leave the island. He was like, okay, fine, I'll, but, you know, and he'll sign off on the piece of paper for his AA meetings and stuff. But, you know, so that was nice that Father Paul did that. And, uh, you know, and um, Father Paul is a really likable guy, even though he wore the, the wrong um, the wrong outfit that, and Bev points it out in front of everyone because she's so nice. And, uh, you know, for people who aren't Catholic, you know, every, you know, high holiday, low holiday, whatever the, f- you know, there's a, a different type of whatever $10,000 fucking outfit they got to put on, you know. <clears throat> like, why don't you just wear a fucking burlap sack since, uh, you know, why you got to make it about what the hell? It's not a fucking fashion show. Anyway, so she kind of busts him on that and, uh, so Father Paul and Riley have this huge discussion about religion and stuff, and then, you know, Riley owns his guilt and all this stuff, and you, you keep on seeing this flash. When he's talking about the accident, you'll see this flash of this girl that you're assuming that's the girl who died in the accident. And um, it was weird. I had, like, this weird mirror effect, like, where she was injured. And like there's like light reflecting on it was kinda kinda different. But uh you know. So they have the mass. Everyone's walking in and Father Paul's just looking at the chick in the wheelchair. And uh he's like staring at her, he's like, You try to stand now. You know, everyone's like, Hey, don't be that, you know, don't what are you doing? And so he goes this whole thing back and forth. Everyone thinks he's being a fucking dick, this, that, and the other. He's like, oh, I can feel it. I can feel it. And this is it, you know. And then all of a sudden, of course, she stands up and, you know, walks up the three stairs to him and gives him a hug. And it's a miracle, you know. All of a sudden, just like that. Yeah, you can say blood of my blood. They kind of flip that whole thing on its head. But I'll get back to uh, what we're talking here. So, Midnight Mass, Book 3, Proverbs. There goes someone on a motorcycle. And that is directed and written by Mike Flanagan. With the addition of James Flanagan as the co-writer of the episode. All right, so from uh, nerdsandbeyond.com, we have uh, 
Book three, Proverbs. Okay, so Father Paul has been on Crockett Island for about three weeks. He's made waves across a small community with the incredible miracle of Lisa, but he's also honoring a troubled secret that's on the verge of boiling over. Let's take a look at some of the major takeaways from the episode. Lisa's discovery and Joe's new journey. The town is in awe over Lisa's recovery as she carefully makes her way through the streets on her own two feet. Lisa decides to finally pay pay Joe a visit, which leaves him shocked as he discovers her standing on the other side of his door. Now that's the guy who shot her in a quote-unquote hunting accident. Bravely, in a heartbreaking moment, she finally confronts him over what he's done. She forces him to look her in the face as she blatantly tells him how angry she is, how upset she is, and how much he took from her, but she also forgives him. Lisa leaves Joe with some harsh, stinging truths as her parting words, which inspire him to finally join Father Paul and Riley at the AA meetings down at the church. Father Paul nudges Riley to take advantage of how much he he has opened up in the past few weeks, encouraging him to try speaking to Joe. Afterward, Joe admits that he uh, he didn't think he'd ever step foot in that place, but he seems happy that he finally did for the meeting. Sheriff Hassan finds himself at odds with Beverly's self-righteous dedication to her religion when she discovers that Ali has, uh, uh, sorry, that Ali, his son, was given a Bible at school. The two have a heated back and forth exchange during a town meeting, which unfortunately doesn't quite go the way he planned. Once she wins over half the room, uh, going on about the town's full-blown religious revival due to Lisa's. It's a miracle. Everybody, can you walk? Can you walk? Yes, you can. Get off your chair. You can walk. Now write a check. Anyway, later at home, Ali asks his father if he can go out and check out St. Patrick's on Sunday, which Sheriff Hassan outright refuses. Ali, upset, accuses him of never letting him make his own choices. He didn't get to choose to be a Muslim, and he didn't get to choose to move to Crockett Island. Sheriff Hassan, however, expresses his own views on these miracles as he reflects back on the devastating pain of losing his wife, Ali's mother, to pancreatic cancer. When Sheriff Hassan goes to turn off uh, Ali's bedside light, he's startled to see a face with glowing eyes staring directly inside the window of the house. So Sarah, the doctor, has her work cut out for her as she's taking care of her mother, Mildred, who doesn't even know where she is half the time, knowing how devout she was before her health declined. Father Paul regularly makes home visits to see her. Clearly, those visits have been paying off because one evening Sarah finds her mother out of bed and standing up on the other side of the room. Sarah's initial concern melts to confusion when her mother, suddenly very lucid, tells her that she feels like she's in a dark place and she just finally woke up. Then the two embrace. So Father Paul is unwell. Shortly after Lisa's miracle shown in the previous episode, we see Father Paul excuse himself from the service very quickly. He runs to the rectory and throws up blood in the sink. Things continue to get worse as as he's performing another service to a packed church, courtesy of the miracle. And he passes out. Then, after his AA meeting with Riley and Joe ends, he collapses on the floor the moment that they leave the rec center. Father Paul manages to drag himself to the rectory where his sink is being fixed while Beverly discusses a plan for a community dinner with Lisa's parents. As soon as he gets inside the door, he careens into a table and then falls to the ground, spitting up even more blood profusely. He eventually goes still and appears that he's dead, until the cutscenes finally reveal his biggest secret before he sits up gasping for air. An identity is revealed. Throughout the course of the episodes, a story unravels in bits and pieces from a scene of Father Paul sitting in a confessional booth before his church service on Crockett Island. He speaks to God about how Monsignor John Pruitt, which was much sicker than the town had thought he was uh, when they sent him to his trip on Jerusalem. His oncoming dementia caused him to wander off from his tour group frequently, and he eventually found himself lost in the desert in the middle of a sandstorm. He took shelter in a cave that had been unearthed Uh, from deep beneath the sand during the storm. By the light of a match, he soon discovered that he was not alone. For there was a figure in the corner of the cave, resembling one of the 
uh, one, bleh, resembling the one that's been skirting around the island. The humanoid creature, winged and hairless, <clears throat> they did a really great job on this thing. So it winged and hairless with long talon-like fingernails began drinking his blood. Then it fed him his own blood, cutting up, cutting open his wrist and letting the Monsignor feed on it. Pruitt woke up the next morning very much alive and young, bearing the face of Father Paul. Now the Monsignor, when they showed him earlier in the episode, you could tell he had on um, old age makeup as well. I kind of thought it might have been Hamish, but I wasn't quite sure. That one they kind of hid better than, uh, well, they had to because they could make it a little different because you're not supposed to know that the Monsignor is actually Father Paul. Okay. Anyway. Well, speaking of his memory, Father Paul does not refer to this creature as a vampire, but rather he regards it as an angel. He brought the creature back to Crockett Island with him in the chest, just like in the Dracula movies. Although it is unclear what exactly what exactly his intentions were in doing this. At the end of the episode, we see the item that Beverly was staring at the wall in the rectory is a dated newspaper clipping of a young Monsignor John Pruitt. Understandably, she had been shocked to realize that he was identical to the town's new priest, Father Paul. Beverly that fucking evil bitch, returns the rat poison to the stock room. So now you know she killed the dog. And that thing that happened to Father Paul on the floor? <laughs> Same kind of shit was coming out of his mouth as was the dog. So that such nice of a person, Bev, um, tried killing the father as well. Warren and Lisa have finally begun to act upon their affection for each other. You know, they have good chemistry. Riley is writing letters for those he needs to make amends with as part of his, as part of the uh, 12-step process and his AA meeting, so he's making amends. And so basically we have questions that remain. So Warren caught Father Paul pouring wine from his own flask into the cup for the congregation, giving what we now know about his identity, but we really don't think that was wine. Um, should we be concerned that Lisa's parents are so against the idea of bringing her into the mainland to inspect the miraculous hearing of her paralysis? So basically the doctor's like, hey, I want to take her to the mainland, get some more tests, see what happened, da 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 see if there's a, you know, maybe a cyst move or something, and da 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 And they're like, oh, no, we want to believe it. You know, you don't got, 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 no, it's the Lord that did it, and we don't want any medical intervention. So... Basically, that's what happened there. And does Father Paul truly believe the vampire is an angel? Did he bring it back to the angel thinking the angel could heal its residents? Hmm? And was Bull killed or turned by the vampire? See, here's the whole thing. They never call it a vampire. They never mention vampires. They never mention Dracula. They never mention any of that. It is basically cloaked in all the... Um, and there's great like monologues and stuff or uh, you know, the priest talks or soliloquies or whatever, and there's no jump scares. You know, it's basically just exposition. So these characters, instead of having some bullshit scene that's in every movie, they actually talk and move a plot forward. Isn't that weird, huh? Yeah, who'd have thought about that? Okay, so moving on to episode Four, we have book four, Lamentations, directed by Mike Flanagan, written by Mike Flanagan and Danny Parker. Okay, and this is off Decider.com by Sean T. Collins. Ad addiction comes in many forms. For some, it's an addiction to substance, like alcohol, but the afflictions of Riley Flynn and Joe Colley for others, it's ruinous personal behavior. Like Bev's keen need to be in the right at all times. Boy, well, sounds a lot like uh, social media, doesn't it? And for others, like Monsignor John Pruitt slash Father Paul Hill, it's a need to consume large quantities of human and vampire blood. Everybody's got a cross to bear. The fourth episode of Midnight Mass centers on the rapid dissolution of Father Paul into vampirism in the absence of a so-called guardian angel. 
the original vampire creature who's been roaming around the island killing cats and drug dealers and whatnot. At his supply, the creature's blood, which he's obviously been dosing his parishioners with, hence their miraculous healing and de-aging, like the mother is starting to de-age now, she doesn't have dementia. And in the case of Erin Green, the sudden termination of her pregnancy and any signs that she's ever been pregnant with. Oh, and let's not forget the the one that they try to make the bad guy and the creep in the story is, of course, the atheist, the unbeliever, the one who questions. Anyway, so the sudden termination of pre- pregnancy and any sign she's ever been pregnant comes with it, okay? So, um, so he can't eat regular food. He can't be exposed to the sunlight without burning as he puts his hand into a beam of light and you see it kind of smoke for a little bit. And when the chance for a meal finally comes, poor old Joe Collins shows up at the rectory looking for support, right? So he has this argument with the with the priest and basically he's like, give me a hug. And then the preacher's like, no, 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 I need blood. <laughs> so he tries, get, you know, and Joe Collins thinks he's trying to hit on him or something. And basically uh, in there was an ensuing struggle uh, to be free of Father Fall. Father Paul's clinging arms, uh, he basically trips, hits his head on the table, and, of course, busts his head right open. The priest does exactly what any good vampire would do under those circumstances. He sees that the guy is dying, and, you know, he goes down like you you think he's going to kiss the dude, but nope. He goes down, and he drinks the guy's blood, first slurping it off the puddle of the floor, and then sucking it straight down from the tap, as it were. Basically chewing on the top of this guy's um, skull and just, you know, eating his brains and, you know, eating the, sucking the blood out and everything. But eventually when the angel returns, which is too bad for poor Riley, returning to the rectory to question Father Paul about an obvious lie he was told regarding Joe's where's about that evening because people started looking for him. Hey, where's Joe? Where's Joe? I was supposed to meet Joe. So he claimed Joe went to go visit his sister on the mainland. That's something that they can't check, you know. But Riley knows for a fact that the woman died months ago because they had a conversation about it previously. He surprises the priest and a sinister benefactor who immediately attacks him. Father Paul closes the door on the scene and on the episode. So basically we see Riley getting fucking uh, turned into a vampire by the quote-unquote angel. So, uh... Here, so this, you know, uh, article, the author of this article goes on to say this. Um, the, the one thing he had a hard time wrapping his head around was in terms of the show's status as horror is its willingness to tug on the heartstrings like a weepy primetime soap. I don't agree with that. <clears throat> it says, I'm perfectly fine with, say, the lengthy pair of monologue. Okay. I'm just, okay, I'm not going to read the rest of that because it's ridiculous. Um I think that they're doing a great job with this. Uh, you know, they got the AA, they have the the addiction. You know, basically you have some people jonesing for drugs, some people jonesing for booze, some people jonesing for blood and death and chaos. And uh, it's interesting to see that, you know, played upon and reflected in each other because basically when it comes down to it, you know, those three groups are all a junkie in their own way. And I'm not uh, disparaging junkies, but hey, seek help. It is out there. If you go to a meeting and it helps, more power to you. And if you find other ways, more power to you. But, okay, so we're going to go in here to episode number five. Again, what's great about this show is that everyone gets these, not everyone, but the main characters get these great monologues that they can just sit in and squirm with and, you know, it's it's really good. You actually get to see some acting and, you know, character development, which is, you know, always a plus. So we're here at uh, book five, The Gospels, written by Mike Flanagan and James Flanagan, directed by Mike Flanagan. Okay. So, concerned over Riley's sudden disappearance, Erin, this is a Wikipedia, files a missing persons case with uh, Sheriff Hassan, who... Apoth- um, who Basically, comes the idea that Riley may have been replaced or committed suicide. Or relapsed or committed suicide. On the evening of Good Friday Mass, Father Paul delivers a sermon 
rife with uh, militaristic rhetoric urging the congregation to prepare for war as soldiers in God's army. The homily upsets Mildred Gunning, whose physical and mental state seems to be rapidly improving Father Paul's visit. Later that night, Riley appears on Aaron's doorstep and asks her to go offshore on a boat with him. Aaron, while suspicious, agrees. Rowing away far from the island, Riley reveals to Aaron what happened to him. After being attacked by the angel, Riley rapidly recovered under the care of Father Paul. Father Paul reveals his true identity to him and tells him that he believes the angel's blood is a gift from God and has been mixing it into the com- communion wine to heal the residents of Crockett Island. Riley leaves the rec center disgusting and leaves a note for his family and Monsignor Pruitt behind before seeing Aaron. Riley tells Aaron he brought her on the boat to isolate himself. And this whole time you're thinking, oh, that motherfucker's going to go out there and kill that kill that nice, beautiful lady. And uh, he declares his love for her, of course, and, you know, they had a thing going on back in high school. And uh, as the sun rises, you basically see Riley fucking combust, and he quickly burns away to ashes as Aaron screams in, a, in horror, and then it goes, you know, cuts to black, and then credits while still screaming. That was pretty good, except I was like, oh, my God, the boat's going to catch on fire and she's going to drown. Um, that was a really cool way because usually you don't see, you know, basically. So he had control over his um, addictions. It was just a different new addiction, but he already had control over it. And he knew in order to uh, uh, tell the truth, he basically had to put his life on the line in order to do so. Really, really cool. Um, another recap here from Nerds and Beyond. All righty, folks, getting right back in. Uh, so we're on episode six. I'm um, sorry I had to split this podcast in two. Should have been out a few days ago, but shit happens. Anyway, um, by now we know that Bev is just a fucking bitch. And uh, I just want to put a shout out to Catherine, my online buddy. Her and her husband, Carl, been immeasurable in my uh, climb back from just uh, not having the best year. All my online friends, got to love them. Anyway, so the best comment I ever saw was, by the way, just fuck Bev. You know, uh, kudos again to that actress who uh, made such a character so well hated. So here we go. Um, We are on... Episode 6, Aaron returns to the island after witnessing Riley burn to death. So, at the end of Episode 5, one of the main characters fucking dies, and that usually doesn't happen. Very surprised. I thought he was going to drag her out there and make her a vampire or a, uh, you know, (laughs) a born-again Christian, so to speak. And uh, that didn't happen. But, uh, no, he was... uh, he actually got his wish of, uh, it seemed like he was kind of suicidal and was wasting his life. For some reason, that's what his thought process was. I'm not, you know, saying anything. If you are feeling suicidal or depressed, please call the suicide hotline. Um, there is someone there waiting to talk to you. Don't feel that you can ever talk to someone because you always can. And that's the hardest thing is just letting yourself admit that uh, you need help. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with getting help. You get a cavity, you call a dentist. You feel uh, like you could be better mentally, eh, get some therapy. Maybe talk to somebody. Maybe even your priest, if that's what does it for you. So anyway, Sarah shows Aaron the de-aged Mildred and how her blood samples are burning under the sunlight and theorizing that Father Ball, uh, Father Paul is inducing medical miracles via the wine at church. Uh, she relays her suspicion to the sheriff Uh, who refuses to investigate the church, fearing further alienation from the locals. Aaron does disclose Riley's death to Annie, who refused to believe her. that uh, Annie is um, Riley's mom and just totally refused to believe her and basically tells her to get the hell out of here and and kicks her off her property. Aaron, Sarah, and Mildred attempt to get to the ferry to the mainland, but discovered Mayor Scarborough has sent the ferries away and witnessed Sturge locking down the fishing boats. So there's no way off the island, no way on. 
That night before Easter Mass, Sturge cuts power to the town and sabotages the cell tower. So now they have no communications um, on the island and no communications to reach the mainland. Um, basically, everyone is stuck, so to speak. And they don't want to be stuck, but the people who want to get off definitely feel stuck. So at Mass, Father Paul reveals that he's Monsignor Pruitt to the residents before unveiling the angel to an awestruck congregation. So Pruitt informs the churchgoers that they, ha- they all have the angel's blood in their vein and encourages them to drink poison to die and be reborn. Several residents drink the poison, including Lisa's parents, Sturge, Ochre, and Al- uh, Ali. Mildred shoots Pruitt and is swooped out of the church by the angel. The undead churchgoers resurrect and attack those who haven't drank the poison. Ed is turned while Aaron, Hassan, Lisa, Sarah, Warren, and Annie escape. Aaron shoots Bev before the group flees into town. Now let's get something fucking clear. So Bev, the evil bitch... She basically connives everyone, has this all happen, and she bails and goes to the back room and hides like a coward. But, as any great vampire story will tell you, the vampire always needs a regular mortal to do their work during the day, so to speak. So, Aaron shoots Bev. Uh, before the group flees into town, uh, a resurrected Bev and Sturge unleash the undead church glowers onto the remaining townsfolk. Now, Father Pruitt, or Father Paul, who's now Monsignor Pruitt, or both, whatever, he had told Bev not to let anyone out of the church while all this was going on. She, of course, doesn't listen because she's fucking righteous. And like anyone else who feels righteous thinks they can do whatever they want, as we've seen over the past few years on people on social media. If you're righteous, who gives a fuck? Hey, we're for everyone to have free health care for all, but now, oh, if you don't agree with me, you know what? Fucking die. Real compassionate. Great work, people. Um, you know, I, it just, you know, you have to be consistent. And if you're not, you're following a herd, period. Kind of like church, but I call social media the church of the Digerati. Anyway. So that was episode number six. We go to episode seven. Oh, sorry. Book six was called Act of the Apostles, directed by Mac, uh, Mike Flanagan, written by Matt, Mike Flanagan, James Flanagan, and Jeff Howard. Now we go to episode seven, which is called Revelation, directed by Mike Flanagan, written by Mike Flanagan alone. He did the first and the last episode by himself. And I'm really, really a huge fan of, like I said before, of writers being able to write the entire series, not just um, pick and choose, you know, three episodes throughout a 22-episode run. Television, uh, programming, streaming program, however you want to call it, is a much better place for storytelling now than films. And, uh, you know, the less episodes, the better. Like I said, no fluff. Um, If you want to have fluff or have a fluffer, that's a different type of entertainment all by itself. Here we go. Revelation. The now-turned Mildred reunites with Pruitt. The two were lovers years ago. And Sarah, the doctor, is their daughter. So when Mildred said she was looking out the window and she saw Sarah's father looking through the glass, it was Father Paul. So the way that they did this was pretty interesting. Um, you know, that that reveal kind of shocked me. It's, it's kind of getting to get, it's weird to get shocked and you know, the last episode of a multi-episode show. Usually, like, okay, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. What I really enjoyed about this show is that you don't know what's going to go on. And, you know, and that's amazing. We don't get that very often these days. Everything is cookie cutter, and we have people who are non-creatives being in charge of the creatives, and the non-creatives don't know their ass from their elbow. But what else is new? Business is business. So anyway, Pruitt confesses that he brought the angel to the island to rejuvenate Mildred so that the two of them could have a second chance to be together. Meanwhile, the few remaining unturned townspeople on Crockett Island set fire to the boats to prevent the turned churchgoers from leaving the island and spreading their contagion to the mainland. 
Bev leads the turn churchgoers on a crusade across the island, killing anyone they can find. Pruitt, horrified by the violence, denounces Bev, and she, in turn, denounces him as a false prophet, because, God forbid, you have a variance of opinion these days. <clears throat> Bev orders her followers to burn down everything in the island, except for the church and the town recreation center. Bases it on the book of Revelations, and she quotes some bullshit thing, you know, which People do all the time. They, you know, they cherry pick what they want to believe in and then be righteous all about it, even though they're fucking evil. You know, religion. Um, okay. Okay. So she intends to use the town recreational center as a shelter for the turn churchgoers during the day, so everyone can be together. Uh, basically, so she can have more control. Sheriff Hassan, Sarah, and Aaron attempt to burn down the church and the rec center, but Sturge suits Sarah. Bev mortally wounds Hassan, and the angel attacks Aaron. Aaron repeatedly slashes its wing as she dies to prevent it from escaping in the mainland. Now, this scene is very sexy. It's got passion written all over it. So, Passion of the Christ, kind of funny. Angel, supposed to be scary, even says so in the Bible. Scary angel, eating the shit out of Aaron's neck. Looks like she's kind of enjoying it. He's definitely enjoying it. And uh, as far as the actress who's playing Aaron, who's now my uh, top celebrity crush, I uh, watched the scene a couple times, got to say. But uh, no, she's a, a really great actress. Kate Seagal, really good. And I'm going to watch whatever she's in because she brings it, man. This whole cast that uh, Flanagan has, his uh, company of actors is just stellar. They're really Really good. Okay. So, where were we? So, uh, da 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 da. Mortally wounds the sound. Oh, so, Aaron repeatedly slashes its wings as she dies to prevent it from escaping to the mainland. Now, all the places to seek shelter are gone. Sun's about to come up. Many of the churchgoers are appalled at what they have done to the town and abandoned Bev's cause. Ali burns down the rec center, leaving no shelter for the churned churchgoers while Pruitt and Mildred burn down the church after their daughter's death. Now, Ali basically, in defiance to Bev, uh, threw a Molotov into the church after he saw his dad get shot for sticking up for what's right. And um, <clears throat> so many of the church growers are appalled. They abandon the town. Uh, Ali burns down the rec center, leaving no shelter for the turned church girls, while Pruitt and Mildred burn down the church after their daughter's death. So after the doctor dies, they decide, you know what? <laughs> Screw Bev and her minions. You know, let's take everyone out. So as dawn approaches, the remorseful townspeople, led by Ed and Annie Flynn, gather to be emulated by the rising sun. Ali and Hassan reconcile and perform one last sala, with Hassan finally succumbing to his wounds mid-prayer. Now, this is very touching because, you know, I was actually looking at the son thinking he would he would go and his dad would actually survive and there'd be a season two kind of a thing and blah, blah, blah. But the way that they did it was really, really cool. You know, basically the dad dies so he doesn't have to see his son pass away because no parent should ever see the death of a, a child. Um, so Pruitt and Mildred hold hands and Watch the sunrise while Bev desperately attempts to dig in the hole on the beach for shelter. It was great to see her actually trying to dig her way into hell. But she's going there anyway, according to her beliefs. Lisa and Warren, who rode offshore to avoid the carnage, are the island's only survivors. Basically, in biblical speak, Adam and Eve have left the island. And they are now, or maybe they have left what is quote-unquote the Garden of Eden and have gone to the mainland. And as they're cruising, they see the vampire angel dude flying over with the holes in his wings, and it's, I think, 30 miles, 35 miles. And the sun's coming up quick, and with his wings damaged, did he make it to the mainland, or did he get vaporized while trying to get there? That's one of the things that uh, will go unanswered. And I hope they don't do a season two just because it, that's just a great way to leave things off, make people wonder. Because, you know, like life, you don't always have closure. 
and that's that. But uh, so they watched the angel attempt to fly away, but noticed its wings are failing as Bev, Ali, Pruitt, Mildred, and the rest of the island's inhabitants die. Lisa tells Warren that she can no longer feel her legs. She was the one who was shot. The miracle was performed. She could walk. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The Lord said to him, said, Vince, grow your hair. He did. He grew his hair. Yeah. You know, some people are, it, it, it gets taken too far, and I'm glad that they made fun of religion in this way. Um, yeah, as you know, I'm, the, I'm involved with Reboot Jesus and twisting and retelling a story, updating it for modern audiences. Not a bad thing. And what's interesting here <clears throat> is that, um, you know, what they did is they took the blood, blood, of, blood of Christ, body of Christ. You know, basically, if you think about it in just plain terms, Catholicism is a blood cult. It is. And you're going, oh, my God, what? Relax. Would you drink blood normally? Would you drink? Would you drink blood? No. Would you eat someone's flesh? No. No, because the chances are if you eat, eat their flesh, you're going to eat their brains and you're going to get the disease and you're going to be fucking a wackadoodle. And, uh, you know, that's one thing that never made sense to me. You know, the, the Catholics all make fun of other people who aren't righteous. And, you know, they have no problem. You know, the priests have, and the Vatican have no problem covering up the massive rape scandal. But, hey, you know, what do I know? It's only 50 million, or sorry, 35 million over the past 50 years. You know, low numbers. Um, but it was good to see the, the way that they did this and flipped it, you know, and they showed that, you know, hey, sometimes the people who say they're going to free you and give you everything you want are the fact the ones oppressing you. Now, if everyone would realize that, they you should also realize that don't believe everything you're told, especially from people in authority. When it's an issue to question people, there's a fucking problem. Always question. And if they say you can't, run the other way. Ladies and gentlemen, my brother from another mother, Rob, just turned up to voice his opinion on Midnight Mass as well. Rob, how's it going, brother? Not bad. How are you? Good. So, yeah, sorry there was a little delay here, but, you know, sometimes shit happens okay. and you got to... Yeah, you absolutely. Know, not do it. But I did want someone to come on, and when you said you'd watch the whole thing, I was like, sweet, I hope you can give me like 10 minutes and, uh, and talk about the show, because I gave my opinion and view on it growing up as a yep. Catholic, and now, <laughs> you know, and then turning into an atheist, and now I want your honest opinion on the show. I thought it was great. Um, there was a couple of holes that I... Uh, and a couple of irrelevant, um, like the cats. I mean, when they went over to the <laughs> island, and you know, I guess that's where they discovered where all the cats were, and you, yeah. know, you saw the eyes uh, glowing and everything like that. I was like, okay, whatever. But taking now, the whole, the, I thought the that was funny. Whole, I thought that was funny because I I texted to the to this I texted this to you privately. That that was like his reaction because he probably hates the whole cat. <laughs> so he got rid of every cat that scared the shit out of him in every movie that he watched growing up on that beach. So to me, that it was pretty funny. I found I humor in that. that before. No real cats were harmed in the production of that movie. They were all fake cats, you know. But anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry to interrupt, but go ahead. No, I, 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 I just, I, to me, you know, not knowing the backstory if that's true or not, but. Uh, I just thought it was irrelevant and kind of like, uh, where are we going with this? But um, as a whole, we, we really enjoyed it. And my wife is Catholic as well. But um, was, it, was it really labeled Catholic? I yes. Mean, he was a priest and everything. Yes. No, it was Catholic. But uh, yeah, that's right. Because uh, what was her name? Bev? Yeah, that fucking bitch, Bev. <laughs> well, the funny thing that the thing that I found most amusing was they're taking scripture right out of the Bible, and I've read the Bible in, in its yeah. entirety, and uh, they turned it to their own um, selfish uh, means reasoning. Yeah, 
Yeah. And, and you know, I I heard a, um, a a saying many years ago that God created man in His own image. Man returned a favor, and it's just that's, well, that's what a good I one. thought. That's what I was thinking. The every, every time that she opened her mouth and started uh, quoting scripture, I'm like, you know what? That may have been in the Bible, but you're making scripture to suit your own selfish needs yeah to, yeah exactly so to me um i totally agree with you exactly what you said the selfish needs and as we've seen you know over the past however many years that we've been alive mm-hmm. people do use religion for a base of hatred and yeah, they will and absolutely. they will and they will take whatever quote from the bible twist it mm-hmm. to back mm-hmm. up their hatred So I think that was like kind of a nod to that. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. But using different things that we've never heard, because if they use the same six ones, you know, if they use the same six quotes that everyone quotes when they're being rude, then it just wouldn't have worked. But they used other ones that made you think. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, because I always wondered, I just, I mentioned this a few minutes ago that, uh, you know, I always wondered, you know, sitting there, you know, because I went to Catholic school and everything, and so you're, you know, you hear, oh, drink of my blood, eat of my flesh, and it's like, what? Right. Yeah. I mean, that's a blood call. I mean, that's weird. I mean, because you really wouldn't. Hey, hey, Rob, why don't you come over here? I just kind of cut myself. You want to drink this? Yeah. You know, even if I was the <laughs> Almighty. The blood of Christ. <laughs> right. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Here you go. Come over here. <laughs> that's what you call. You it. know, if you actually saw someone drinking blood and eating flesh, you'd call the police. Oh, absolutely. So that that yep. that's always been a weird disconnect thing for me with that. I'm with you. Yeah, it's one of those things I started questioning in school, you know. Also like, you know, cuz I asked I asked the nun one time and I saw, you know, I was I was the youngest of five, so I had older siblings and she was wearing a wedding ring. And my oh, yeah. you know, I had one sister who got married in first grade and I'm in second grade, got another sister about to get married and they're going on their honeymoon. So this is the talk around the house. I'm I'm eight years, seven, eight years old. And uh, I'm like, oh, Sister Mary, why are you wearing that wedding ring? I thought you couldn't get married. She's like, oh, I'm married to the Lord. I'm like, okay, well, where are you going on your honeymoon? I got beat. <laughs> I got beat and got in trouble. <laughs> totally innocent. You question the word of the Lord. Totally. In- I'm like, seriously. I'm like, oh, well, my sisters are getting married. They're going on a honeymoon. Why wouldn't God go on a honeymoon? Everything's free. <laughs> You know, so that was like one this of the worst creation. Yeah, I'm like, well, I'm just asking a question. So that's why I've always been known as the that guy who asks the questions. Just because yeah. if something doesn't make sense, I just want an answer. You know, there's nothing right. wrong. You know. But. Yeah, as I stated before, I, I, I was brought up uh, Presby- Presbyterian, and my 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 grandmother was a God fearing Christian, but she never used scripture against me. Um, the only thing that she ever said was, "You do not use the word uh, the Lord's name in vain." I to this day I still don't know what that means, but um, in in the context that it, I think that it was derived, and when when people say "God damn it," yeah. that, it, it, I get offended, and that was one of her things that you know you do not say that you do not take the Lord's name in vain. I'm like, well. God's real name is not of this earth, so how do we even know what God's real name is? So when we right. say that phrase, it's kind of like, are we really saying the Lord's name in vain? And then again, with uh, the whole, you know, Jesus Christ. Um, not his name. Right, right. And it's one of those, uh, you know. Well, you, I'm sure you've seen the meme where you know you got a picture of Jesus looking at the clock and you know it's like Jesus Christ, what time is? Or look at the time. And I'm just like to my grandmother that would be using the Lord's name in vain. Yeah. And I just don't understand. Uh, I even though you know be, because I respect my grandmother and her re, uh, religious beliefs and stuff, I really don't like. Um, saying those phrases, yeah, and in in, in, in that context, but um, I, I I'm I'm still befuddled, and she and she always instilled in me, you do not question the Lord, and I'm like, right. okay, yeah, like right. when when yeah. my grandma passed on, and I was the only one out in California when she did, so I was taking care of things and blah blah, and uh, <clears throat> so my dad comes out, the whole family comes out, whatever, 
to have the funeral. And as you know, I'm not religious. I'm spiritual, mm-hmm. but I'm not a religious guy. But my grandmother was. Mm-hmm. And she tried getting me to church for the longest time. You know, I'd take her to go see Sister Act and the Sister Act 2 and all kinds of, you know. Yeah, it didn't yeah. bother me. It just wasn't my thing, you know. So, sure. Um, so it's my grandma. So she's like, okay, I know grandma's in the room. You know, I'll I'll take communion. Yeah. You know, and my dad's like, you know, you're going to burn in hell if you take communion. <laughs> you know, I'm like, hey, dad. And I stood up in the middle of the fucking funeral home. If I can't take communion, may God strike me dead. Okay, I'm oh. good to go. You know what I mean? <laughs> Fuck off. I'm just doing it out of respect. And if you don't get that, then yeah. that's, you know, whatever. If you think I'm going to go yeah. to hell, well, I've got a list. That's not how the Lord works, Vince. Right. <laughs> right. I know. He's retiring. He's got five more shows. <laughs> Sorry, I prayed to the God, the almighty David Lee Roth. But, <laughs> there you uh, go. No, but I joke. But the, Yeah, there was a thing. I mean, I think that uh, when she was being uh, devoured by, uh, what, what would you call him, the head vampire? The, the angel, according to Bev, he was the angel. <laughs> Yes. When she was, uh, you know, being devoured and she took the knife and started slitting his wings, I'm just like, what is she doing here? Dude, because... that was the hottest scene of that whole miniseries. <laughs> now, as you know, this Kate Siegel is my new celebrity crush. And, you know, because the, the, the vampire tale has always been considered erotic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. And it's had, right. you know, like maybe what they used to say, quote unquote, homosexual overtones, this, that, and the other. No, it's erotic mm-hmm. passion. Yeah. yeah. You know, so the way that they displayed that was very interesting because there's it also a play on the other thing called the passion of Jesus Christ. Okay. So I'm like, okay, the passion, that's for, you know, there's a lot of inside. If you grew up as Catholic, there's a lot of, if you didn't, some things may just pass you by. Not you, yeah. but you know what I mean? You've read the Bible, so you you know, unlike most Catholics and Christians who they haven't. Yeah. You know, and I'm not, you know, it's just a fact. I'm not stating anything that's not unknown and I'm not bashing on people who do read the Bible. If it helps you through the day, more power to you. You know, I'll support your right to do that. If you support my right not to, you know what I mean? That's basically how I look at it. Well, here's a secret too about me. It's like, I've read the satanic Bible as well. So yeah. (laughs) By Anton LaVey. I mean, I wanted to know both sides of humanity. Well, not so much humanity, but both sides of religion. And, it, you know, there's a lot of shit in, in the Satanic Bible where, you know, I understood what it is and the lies that it presented, and, you know, for, for your own selfish um, gratitude, for lack of a better term. Mm-hmm. So I understood what they were trying to say and, or what Anton LaVey was trying to say. And whether you agree with it or not, it was just one of those, uh, it was a phase I went through and I told my sister, I said, to me, religion is two sided. There's the, there's the dark side and there's the light side. You know, obviously the Christian is the light side. So I wanted to know, and not, not so much to pick or choose which side I wanted to be on, yeah, but it's just like okay, what's the other side saying about religion? So you know that was just my own personal curiosity. But uh, you know, having read, you know, obviously the Satanic Bible and Necronomicon, and um, oh, you did read the Book of, of the Dead and Necronomicon. Yeah. yeah, that was read in my apartment before I moved back into the before I moved into the dorms. And mm-hmm. everyone who di- I refused to do it, I didn't want that fucking book in my house. Oh, I get it. There's some things are just not right. I like a Ouija board. I don't want that in my house. Me either. You know, and uh, everyone involved who did wound up having to quit school, got arrested, went to jail, or something bad happened to them within a week. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and like we got broken into, they stole all our shit. You know, I was like, you know, okay, you know. Yeah. But I mean, some things are just, you know, unexplainable. You know what I mean? Mm hmm. But, yep. uh, yeah, the group of actors that this guy brought on is, is just amazing, and apparently he works with the same kind of uh, group of people. Oh, okay. You know, I mean, I basically, I saw Hamish uh, Linklater on 
the poster. Then I saw the dude, uh, Henry Thomas from ET and I'm like, okay, I got to watch this. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's right. I forgot about that. Mm -hmm. Man, he's aged. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, it, well, at first, well, cause they had the old age makeup on him. Yeah, in, oh, the, in, in the first two episodes, as he was getting better, his back got better and everything, and you yeah. know, it's pretty interesting. And apparently, over the past ten years, during um, Flanagan's other projects, he's referenced this project. It's either been on a bookshelf or someone's talking about it in his other shows. Oh no, kidding! So yeah, so this has been an in-universe um, project that he was hoping to get. And okay. I mentioned earlier, he's doing. Um, Fall of the House of Usher as a miniseries, and that I no can't, shit. I can't wait to see that. You know, I need to read the book before I see the series, yeah, or movie or whatever they yeah. turn it into. Yeah, and I like the fact that this also didn't have, um, it didn't have any jump scares. That's what the like the meow. That's a jump scare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm fucking sure. Well, they did though when when um, he walked in on the priest and the head vampire. And he's just like wondering what the fuck is going on, and right, you know, yeah, because because it, it's yeah, because it's always been been funny to me that angels are you know they're either just picked it as chubby little kids or you know there's cubes yeah there's cherubs there's, cherubs, there's cupid there's this there's that there's the archangels all this stuff, but if right. you actually read what the Bible says they're fucking hideous, yeah, you know okay. like almost can't be looked upon basically, right, you know so. Being true to the story, now is it is now is the shock factor that they were true to the story, or is it the shock factor of people realizing that they were true to the story? Like once Probably removed, both. you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Nice, uh, Amy from uh, AIFL just texted me said she just watched the first four episodes of Dope Sick. That's going to be Amy, Amy Ferris. No, 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 McMahon. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's another great show for another time. I mean, if you haven't seen that I, yet. I watched the first episode last night with uh, Rose, and she got into it, so now I can't Dude, watch it by myself. Michael Keaton. He's great, man. Acting in a role that he's never done. He's never been that guy. Yeah. Like, he's usually the alpha. Yeah. Yeah. He's yep. not the the you know the you know the subtle little hey how you doing and it's really interesting because yeah. we know he can act that's not yeah. even a yeah. question so to see him go in a different way was really kind of exciting for me you know but we digress yeah and wait <laughs> and just wait as it goes on you it's he he's well, if he we doesn't can, we can it, save that for another yeah, episode yeah, right yeah exactly but if he doesn't win awards for that. Oh, he's great. Man. Yeah, it'd be I a mean, shame. just the first episode that I watched, it was like, damn. Yeah, and I have total respect for him because no other actor really is bringing up subjects that need to be talked about seriously. And they absolutely do. Right, and he's done that with this, and he's also done it with the the um, Catholic Church scandal um, oh, yeah. out of Pennsylvania when he did that um, show about the, uh, the movie about the, um, uh, the newspaper that broke the story. That's right. And that's he won right. award. Everyone won awards. It was really well done. So kudos for him for doing that. But back, mm -hmm. back to the Midnight Mass. So Mike Flanagan, mm -hmm. the writer and the writer of all episodes, um, co-wrote maybe half of them, and then the rest of them he wrote himself. He was born in Salem, Massachusetts. Oh, okay. So how so much history? Yeah. So how much of that is from that? Right. Yeah. Like, how does that affect you as a creative person being born in Salem, Massachusetts as a kid and you think witches are everywhere? Yeah, you're right about what you know. You know? Yeah, exactly. And the whole thing is people are always scared of the witches, but, you know, no one ever preached to be scared of the people burning the witches. Absolutely. And those, Absolutely. And those were the guilty and, uh, you know, they were very religious, pious people. Yeah, but, allegedly. Uh, yeah, and what's really interesting... But, yet, but yeah, they're kidding, <clears throat> killing all the Indians, you know, <laughs> as they're doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, t ridiculous. We don't tolerate witches, but, you know, we can kill off all the savages. Yeah. Oh, they can't... What, what are they dancing for? What? Mm -hmm. Crops. Crops! <laughs> what? 
They're, they're praying yeah, for I positive mean, things, not who can kill each other better and more. What the fuck? <laughs> we can't have that. What? Whoa, whoa, hold on. They're happy. They have a balance. Like, what? Yeah. They don't ruin I'll everything it, that they touch? I'll I'll okay, we can't. God. We can't have that. Yeah. No. No. You know? But what's really interesting, What I think what made this show even better was the fact that everyone had been locked down for a year, and this was like their first gig, and on top of it, they're on this small little shitty island. Yeah. So, like, people yeah, were... 147 people or something like that, right? Yeah. So, like, people were just happy to be, like, working and present somewhere. Yeah. And then the added thing onto that, I think that totally, it just, you know... If they had done it at any other time, I don't think it would be... It'd still be good, but it wouldn't be as good due to that fact. Yeah. Because everyone had the feeling of isolation. And, you know, what happens when you don't go along with the crowd, there's a lot to be said in the narrative of this thing and how um, mob mentality and mass hysteria can turn people in an instant against people. Like I mentioned before earlier... You know, like a year and a half ago, everyone was like, you know, health insurance for everybody, health care for all. Oh, you didn't do this thing. <laughs> Let them die. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's like, oh, yeah, real compassionate. Oh, so you aren't really that way. Thanks for letting us know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, and just in case someone hasn't thought of this in the last 10 minutes, by the way, Bev can really go fuck herself. <laughs> that actress, amazing job. She should win. She really, yeah, yeah, yeah. She did her job very well. Absolutely. You know, uh, just like Captain America, he he put he was putting that role for people to hate too. Right. And he did very well, Mister Russell. Mm-hmm. 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 <laughs> but yeah, you know. But yeah, the hyper. You know, it basically made everyone hyper focused. Yeah. You know, and the mob mentality just spoke early because they could literally look around and see it. It wasn't something that we read about. Right. Yeah, he did a good job. You know, and as we're seeing, you know, like today, you know, we don't talk politics, but I can talk about something that happened, is um, the NIH came out, National Institute of Health, and admitted that indeed at the Wuhan clinic there was gain-of-function research. Fauci knew about it. And lied repeatedly to Congress, lied repeatedly to the repeatedly to the people, and as a servant to the people, uh, I believe it is his responsibility to immediately tender his resignation, because if he yeah. lied about that, he lied about a lot of other shit. Oh yeah. And now all these people that have been the naysayers and the anti this or whatever have been proven correct. Yeah. So now what's going to happen? Now we're at a stalemate, unfortunately, because the news made healthcare a political thing, and that's really too bad. But I know. like I said in this earlier, just like religion, just like with government, always question, and if they say you can't, something's wrong. Right. You know, it's like, hey, um, can we wash these blankets? Don't worry about it. You'll get cold. And I'll, you, know. <laughs> you know, I mean, really, you know, and then the, the government got, you know, the pharmaceutical companies, they tested um, AIDS medication on foster kids in the 90s, 200 here just in Illinois. Oh, and yeah. a lot of these kids died, and they weren't told that they were even on the thing, and then they were denied um, health care advocates by the, by the pharmaceutical companies because they said they don't need them. Right. So, there, you know, when, whenever there's something bigger than a human being, I always question because chances are they're up to some no good... No good. Screen. Yeah, they're up to no good. But uh, yeah. off of that. So, um, Rob, what are you, uh, out of uh, 12 cup? Okay, so a pot of coffee is 12 cups. Yep. So from one to 12 cups of coffee, how do you rate um, Midnight Mass? Well, I think when I first started watching it, I wasn't too sure. And I did go off on your um, recommendation. And I ended up, after the first episode, I kind of like, well, let me see what second episode brings. And then I, I was like into it. And then next thing you know, Rose is like standing up from her computer. She's peeking over, looking at the screen. And especially when the priest started um, 
quoting the uh, Bible and everything. That's what she was really into. And then she's like looking at me like, uh, what's going on here? Because I know that scripture and that's not how I deciphered it or interpreted it. So right. she started getting into it. So then she starts asking me all these questions. And, you know, like that's when I started, well, they had a little bit of holes, but for the overall, uh, to answer your question, I think I would have to go with 10 out of 12 cups. Meow. Because I, <laughs> exactly. Uh, it, I would, like I said, I would give it a 12, but there was a couple of things that were just unanswered. Yeah. Um, irrelevant, I, like I said, with the cats and everything like that. And if that's true about the backstory about his cats and everything, well, okay. I mean, that's why I would put it in there. Yeah. You know, and, totally. Um, but for again, it goes back to you know when he was when she was laying there being devoured and she was slicing his wings. It's like um, there was no resolution at the end, and maybe that uh, pro is is like foreshadowing um, story number two. If that if they decide to go there, okay, right. then he made it to back to his cave in the condition that he was, yeah. or. Because they didn't show that he was, you know, burned by the sun. You know, did did he make it back to his cave, or did he? Uh, is he, you know, holding up and waiting for somebody else to come back in and start the other, start a next uh, pandemic? Yeah, well, yeah, or, I meant, yeah, I mentioned this. Or, I mentioned or this. Did he burn? Yeah, I mentioned this to, about ten minutes um, before uh, called in. Um, uh, to me. Um, you know, so he had all these cuts in his wings. Okay, the sun's coming up. He's got, is it 30 or 35 miles to get to the mainland? But he was also holed up in that house, too, though, where he was uh, devouring on a one woman. Right, but they burned was, everything um, down. There was no... Oh, that's true, yeah. Yeah, so there was that's nowhere right. for him to go, so he had to bail. Yeah. And then you have the, um, you know, essentially you have... Adam and Eve leaving the island, leaving the gar their, gar their Garden of Eden, and you have Adam and Eve right. floating off into the new world. And, you know, to me, that meant, like, okay, so evil's leaving. But is he going to make it 30 miles at the way that he was flying? I don't think so. Right. And then he'd also have to find shelter in that time. Sure. So I don't know what the cave systems are or what actually where, where they were off of. Right, you know, in the you know in the on the globe, but you know, most likely probably you know off of like Canada somewhere. Well, you saw the uh, series Dracula last year, right? Um, was that the one that was done by the Doctor Who guy? It was like a four I believe episode. Believe so, yes. Um, because at, at one point that he he said that when he was um, thrown from the ship, that he walked on the bottom of the ocean for thirty five years to get to land. So, I don't. I'm not saying that they're going to rip off that storyline. Oh, but, well, that's interesting. Know, the, See, I didn't know that. Yeah, but uh, you know, they could obviously. <clears throat> well, if the if the angel didn't make it back to his cave, then you know they're on an island, so he could actually dive into the water and just. Right, if the water's deep know. enough, not to go mm -hmm. have so much. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, <clears throat> normally, like I said. I if it's a vampire show, I don't watch it. <laughs> um, unless it's Blade or you know something, you know the Marvel Blade stuff or whatever. I'm just oh, yeah. not a big Dracula fan. I mean, I, I was fan of <clears throat> Universal Dracula. Then uh, yeah, you know Bram Stoker's. But when the whole vampire craze started, it just turned me off. I know. Yeah. You know. But, uh, you know, and I but just, actually, when, I was inspired because I wanted to make a uh, shapeshifter vampire. So uh -huh. I was a little bit inspired. <laughs> well, that, that's good. You still should. You still should write that, by the way. I know. I know. I, I, I got a lot of I got my my notes and everything like that. I just don't want to be too. Yeah, they have. Uh, they do have a new series coming out. It is about a changeling and it's Native American based. Great. So stealing all my ideas. Right. It happens. I know it. You know. But yeah, so okay, so back to the rating system. Out of 12 cups of coffee, I would have given it a 10, but I am going to give it an 11 because Kate Siegel. 
There you go. Yeah, and <laughs> fuck Bev. A, yeah, dude, man, when when he burned in front of her, it's like that acting. When when he when she was yeah. watching him, I'm just like, wow, it was powerful. Yeah, she brought it. I mean, they both did. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that was a nice flip because usually that's the setup when when the girl, you know, a young couple out on a yeah. boat. <laughs> The sun about to come up, and he's mm. a vampire. You know, I yeah. thought he would totally just, and you know what? And I mentioned, you know, earlier, he seemed to be a, a bit suicidal the entire show. Yes, yep. You know, whether it was depression or wanting to pay eye for an eye, you know, I, I chalk it up for eye for an eye because it's, you know, yeah. biblical. Biblical. Yeah, you know, but, you know, Bev was the bi- biggest sinner of them all. She was awesome. Oh man, when she killed that dog, I'm like, you fucking. Oh man, no shit. <laughs> you asshole. I love that dog. Yeah, you know, and the guy's like, oh, oh, you know, <laughs> someone we'd hang out with probably and, you know, give shit to drinking a couple of beers at the bar. But, yep. you know, it, and then I was like, no way. She just killed the father. Remember when he went into a scene and he started choking? She yeah. didn't know that he was going to come back. Yeah. So she tried to fucking yep. kill. You know, oh, as soon as everyone started coming, hey, let's kill the priest, and now I'll be in charge. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's what power does to people. That's not a paid ready. position, what she was doing. She did that on her own. Mm-hmm. You know, she basically leaned on the church and, you know, corrupted it. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's corruption you in everything. scripture for her own <clears throat> personal gain. Yeah. You know, like, a lot of people do that. But uh, really, yeah, right, <laughs> right, yeah. Okay, the Lord wants me to do business up in the clouds, closer to Him. All I need for you people is to send me a check for sixty five hundred dollars a piece, and you will be saved. And if you can't <laughs> so afford it, we do. Jet. Yeah, and if you can't afford it, we do have a uh, we do have a payment system that you can sign up for, and uh, you're good to go. <laughs> Yeah, that's just I can't crazy. That guy did that. Yeah, and it's not the first time either. You know. No, no, you're right. Say like, hey, sure. Oh my. Where God. do I sign the check? Right, you know, and, Ooh, and I make the check out. Here. You know, and to me, you know, my view on it, because I just, you know, from the purity of the story and what he said to do, you don't take what someone says to do as a directive and change it. Mm-hmm. And so, really, to me. Anyone going to a church ain't the real deal. If a guy's preaching in the park with yeah. nothing around him and he's broke, so box, yeah, that's the dude. Yeah, you know because he's actually being more, you know, if you believe in it and everything, and you believe the Bible, he's actually being more Christ-like than right. these people who spend, you know, twenty thousand dollars on an outfit and their gold ring. And they're sparkly red shoes. I don't know why the Pope wears sparkly red shoes, but, you know, I wonder if he's got those in pumps. Well, why did Dorothy? Right? <laughs> well, you know, exact. well, Dorothy had to steal it from the witch. There you so go. So why was the witch wearing sparkly there high heels? There you go. With, with, by the way, striped leggings? <laughs> that does not really go together if you think about it, you know. <laughs> My goodness. Yeah. You know, if they're a fishnet, everyone would go, I'm like, oh, okay. Sure. Hello. That works. Okay, fishnets. Kinky. Yeah. <laughs> Kinky. Bring in the flying monkeys. <laughs> Those things used to scare the living hell out of me, man, when I was a kid. Tell me about it. Those and those little creatures from the uh, the Karen Black movie. Um, I do believe in spooks. I do believe in oh. spooks. I do, I do, I do. <laughs> yeah. Put them up, put them up. Uh, if I was king of the forest. <laughs> <laughs> Never gets old. Nope. It's a classic. Yeah, what a great movie. You know. Oh, man. They don't make them like that anymore. No, and for good reason. But... Uh, <laughs> Holy moly. Many have tried. Yeah, so I'm really interested to see. I'm going to go watch the uh, the, haunting, uh, the Haunting of Blythe Manor, I think it's called. 
The Haunting I, of uh, Bly Manor. I think we've watched the first episode. And, and then he also did Hush and me. Oculus. Oh, okay. So I'm going to go back and watch. I think I've seen Oculus, and that was really good. There's right. There was two movies named, and one was like Oculus and the Ocular. Okay. Or No, the Oculus. One was Oculus, and, and I don't know which one I watched. <clears throat> there's been a couple movies like that when we're talking. I'm like, well, there's two really close, and I don't know if we're talking about the same show, Rob. Okay. Remember, there was something, I forget what the other one was, about six months ago we were talking, and we're like, that's not the show I watched. I'm like, oh, there's two <laughs> shows kind of, you know, named almost the same yeah. thing, you know. But, yeah, I'm interested in watching anything this guy has to do from here on out for sure. All right. You know? You know? You know? Get on it. Get on it. So, yeah, so coming up, uh, you know, Jason, I guess, is reaching out to uh, Pete, see if he wants to come on the show. Oh, awesome. Yeah, so that would be fun. Uh, um, our buddy Pete was an instructor for all of us in college, and I'm, we won't drop his last name until he agrees to be on the show because we don't want to make him uncomfortable in any way. But, uh, you know, he was one of the teachers that everyone totally respected, you know. Absolutely. I mean, most, for the most part, all our teachers were cool, but he had, like, the respect. Yes, he did. Because he was, like, the working guy, the guy who could get you on shows, the guy that if you showed interest – he would be like, he would totally hype you up. Well, he, he had a... Um, He's a great cheerleader. And I don't mean that third, in any negative no, he had, way. He had like a third eye that he could see your where you excelled and he put you in that position. Yeah. And he so, treated I mean, you like a working, a coworker. Oh, yeah. He didn't treat you, you like a student. Guy, he yeah. knew you were a sound guy and he put you on sound as opposed to, oh, I know you're a sound guy, but I want you on video tonight. Right. No. He, and he, he he basically taught us how to be professionals. There you go. I mean, just by yeah. leading by example, right? And all the all the all the kids, all the students that did well, obviously stuck around. It wasn't the break people, right? Yep. But all the ones that stuck around, he's like, "Hey, I got a gig for five people. Who wants?" You know, and if you stuck around and bullshitted with them after class, as we always did, you'd got that's how you got those jobs. Mm-hmm. But we weren't there for that. We were there to hear the rest of the story that he wouldn't tell in class, you know. Right, yeah, yeah. You know, on certain occasions. But, you know, I don't know how many gigs we worked with Pete, you know. Well, I, I mean, he, he had me do um, – I did my class with him, and I forget uh, the band. But I think that um, your class, which was a different class than mine – you guys did um, the groove things, but I had done yeah. a separate class, and then I was brought in for um, the another class. But I don't remember um, who the other band was. I think I did a uh, three well, different um, productions, and one of them, I think Dan Dan Moore. Yeah, because I was on uh, all was, three of them. Yeah, because I was, was running all the video shit. Yeah. So um, I think yeah, didn't Dan we do had, like Napoleon yeah, Solo or something? What's that? Wasn't Napoleon Solo one of the bands? Yes. Yep. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, it was Napoleon Solo. It w- I still had the uh, four track. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, oh, yeah. The Groove Things, yep. and the quarter before that is when Marilyn Manson and the Spooky Kids fucking destroyed the stage. Oh, okay. And fucked up like a bunch of mic stands and stuff, and uh, Yonelis got all pissed off about it. Yeah. Well, as rightfully so. Things. You know, and this was before, you know, Marilyn Manson and the Spooky Kids was Marilyn Manson, you know. But. Right, yep. So, yeah, we walked the halls with Twiggy. Yes. You I know. remember that. Yeah. He's a cool guy. His dad was really cool. He was at the time, but yeah. Yeah, his dad that. taught uh, art history. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes. Cool. His dad was totally cool, too. I loved it. He did a really good, uh, he was really, that was a great class. Yeah. You know. Having, uh, you know, delved deep into art history prior to, you know, in high school and stuff like that. Because I was on the fast track when I was in, I had a full ride for college for painting and drawing at the Art Institute of Chicago. And I was right, kicked yeah. out of my house. And my mom sa- sabotaged that, basically kicked me out. Mm. So I couldn't do that, you know, da 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 And so I wound up going to that one down there. Funny how things work out. Yeah. So, I mean, whatever, but, you know. It's it's just you no know, yeah Pete would be a great person to talk to because when he even now, I mean 
you know, he's, you know, he's, I don't know how old is he. He's at least ten years older than us. I would, I would think, or maybe ten years. Yeah, older. I mean, well, he was when when was he uh, tour manager? Because um, that was uh, the height of that band, which will be unnamed. Um, when he was telling the stories about that, he was a tour manager for them. But uh, it would just well, you you kind of do the math, and I would say that he's. If, if that was in '80s and he was a tour manager, then we're we're being taught by him by in the '90s. Then yeah, at really. least at least ten years older than us. So maybe and a spry young individual he still is, by the way. Yeah, yeah. But it's interesting. Even even now, I love when he posts stuff about the gigs that he worked. Yeah, because yeah. you can tell that he just loves it. After 40, 30, 40 years of doing it, whatever, he he fucking loves it. He did, and he's the one that told me, and the reason why I never went into um, stage production is, like, you got to love the job. You can't love the money because you're not going to get paid much money. Yeah. So I'm like, well, why would I go into the field where I'm not going to get paid much? And, you know, that was my naive, my, my naivete right. speaking because uh, – once I did get into um, concert production, I absolutely loved it. And uh, my boss at the time was saying, you know, if if you really want to get um, credential with being a stage manager or production manager or even a tour manager, I can make a phone call and you can go on tour with Metallica or the Stones. I'm just like, what? Yeah, make the call. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't. I didn't. I, I said, yeah, you know, I, I don't want to. I don't want to go. On, I don't want to live on a bus. I don't want to, you know, yeah. take a suitcase and have to do my laundry every every week from a bus. I, I don't want to do that. Yeah. You know what? I mean, I got offered a tour as well. And, uh, you know, as much as I love music and, as you know, I went there to be an audio engineer. And then once I spent a day in a dead room, I'm like, nope. <laughs> No, thank you. I'll tell stories and use music and visual stuff. So there you go. You know, uh, you know, uh, and I had done, you know, I don't know how many gigs we did with Pete, and I liked every one of them. Absolutely. You know what I mean? But I also yep. knew who I was working with. Oh yeah. And I also did other, you know, roadie gigs prior to coming down there, and I yep. know everyone I worked with there, and I didn't really care for it. Yeah. But it's, you know, who you're around and everything else. And my whole thing is, like, if I went on tour, I mean, that's when I kind of changed from the, I mean, I was a hard party or rowdy guy anyway. I kind of calmed down a little bit, or at least I had focus, you know. So yeah. I was still partying, but I had focus, never missed a day, always woke up on time, you know, blah, blah, blah. Right. But, uh, yeah, I knew if I went on tour, I'd either die from, you know, like taking too much drugs or, you know, alcohol. Oh, or, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Just because they're like, oh, okay, hey, Vince, do that. Ha ha ha. <laughs> you know, next thing you know, you know, you know, I'm like speeding on a motorcycle 120 miles an hour with Lemmy on the back, you know, something. Absolutely. You know. Yeah. And I was like, nah, you know, nah. You know, so then when I got into film, I travel differently and you travel better sometimes yeah. depending on the level. You know, because if you're doing a commercial, you're going to stay in a good hotel anyway. If you're doing, a, sure. if you're working on, you're going to stay in a good hotel, unless well, you're in a small the, town. The things have changed nowadays, though, right? Too. Yeah, and if you were then going to tour with a small band, chances are you're sleeping on a bus in a van, five guys oh, in a room. Remember. Fuck that. <laughs> you know, like I, I also got one of the first things I got offered when I moved to L.A. was to go down to Antarctica for six months and do a documentary on the penguins. No shit. And I'm like, I grew up pass. in Chicago. Hard pass. <laughs> no. I mean, I had no money. And I'm like, nope. And they're like, oh, it's $450 a day, and we'll buy you all the cold, you know, the cold weather gear. I'm like, nope. <laughs> Absolutely not. I mean, six months at that amount of money and not being able to spend it plus per diem, I would have came back with, you know, hundred grand. You know, but I was like, hell no. Right, yep. You know, that's insane. And, you know, I would have been able to do camera work on documentary, but I was like, nope. You know, sometimes it's just not worth it, you know? I know it, yeah. 
You know, the other. Yeah, it, I'm sure some people would love it. Yeah, and, not and people don't know much about the music business. They think they do because they go to a show, but you know, like when you do a music video, for people who don't know, you know, bands, as Rob well knows, they're on a tight schedule. It's like the military. Mm-hmm. You know, especially if you're a big band, it's it, you have a huge machine moving here. Okay, well, we need to do these three videos, but we're touring and we're doing PR and we're doing all these radio spots and da 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 da. And we're doing Leno on this day. We're doing Letterman on this day. Okay, so the band has a 26 hour window to fly in and do this music video, which means you're working 26 fucking hours. Mm. You know, so the money's great, but it was just a drag because you're working extremely long hours. Oh yeah. You know, and the band for the band too. I mean, they're friggin' tired. Oh, absolutely. You know, like uh, Queensryche played here the other day. I didn't get to see him. And Todd Latore, the singer, said, "Yeah, man, you know, rough show." He said they did great, but he only had the whole band only had an hour and a half sleep. Oh, geez. You know, these guys are sixties. You know, sixty years old. They need sleep. Yeah. Yep. You know, just like a forty year old needs sleep. <laughs> but you know, you, there's not always time. And now the bands, the big bands, they 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 weekend tour, right? You know, they fly in. They don't have you know sixteen trailers. They got one guy in a truck, maybe two, you know, bringing the shit that they have to use. And they got rental stuff and, you know, house PA, whatever, da, da, da. You know, mm-hmm. so they fly in, you know, with their guitar in hand and plug in and then they're ready to go. Yep. But, uh, you know. Yes, I do. What are you going to do? Yep. That's going to cost me. <laughs> I, I I don't miss the... Uh... New Year's Eve turnovers that we used to do because those used to be 36, 40 uh, hours right. overnight. Yeah. So we would uh, have to be there. Uh, well, we would be setting up stage on the 30th and we would have the um, high rollers dinner yeah. on the 31st, do a concert. And then we'd have to turn the stage over for, um, New Year's Day shenanigans. Right. So that was easily 36 hours. And it just, you know, being uh, a person in charge, yeah, you don't sleep. Right. But, and, and your A crew really doesn't get a chance to sleep. But your B crew, okay, you're cutting them at, you know, whatever time, 9 o'clock, okay, be here at 6 a.m. At least they get to go home and have maybe eight hours of sleep before they come back. And that's right. the B crew. The A crew, you're waiting until um, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock until uh, the people shove out. And then you're turning, then you're uh, shutting everything down, tearing everything down and rebuilding right. for a different stage for, for the different shenanigans on the next day. So, yeah. So yeah, that was that was. Uh, I don't miss that whatsoever. But that was one of the things that um, my old boss and another rigger were telling me when they were on tour with whether it would be Ozzy or uh, Metallica or the Stones in the old days. It was a straight thirty-six hours, forty-eight hours, or forty-two hours, or whatever. Turn around, you mean? And turn around. Well, it would be building the stage, right? And um, but now. Uh, it, well, this was like 10, 15, 20 years ago when they would be doing that. But now, because of the union was involved, it's like, no, you can't do that with your employees. So that's kind of like how the um, the bigger uh, tours like Kenny Chesney and um, Stones, they would um, have two production um, setups. Yeah. So they would uh, – so one, one – You'd one slingshot them. So you'd, have, so you'd have two, you'd have two crews – Yes. And so A would be in Charlotte, North Carolina, um, for yep. the show that's tomorrow night. And crew B would be in um, Atlanta, Georgia, setting up the show for Thursday. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And then they would um, leapfrog yeah. to the next city. So Yeah, I think, Meta- Met- I think Metallic, I don't know if it was Metallica or Kiss, the, the last like huge tour, I think it was Metallica when they had the whole... Like all the crosses in the stage and stuff during mm-hmm. the round. I think they had three setups, and that was like a three million dollar stage. Oh wow! Well, I know you two did that too. Yeah. But they did but it. Yeah, I don't you know, miss those days. They but... did it, you know, in the name of love. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, yeah, he um, said that they don't do that anymore. So he was able to, uh, they actually, you know, got a good night's sleep. Yeah. So. And the other thing is, like, you know, dude, the music business people, the booker, they're slave drivers, literally. It's Absolutely. like, you know what? Don't book a band for, you know, 26 shows in a month. Mm-hmm. Book them for 12. Sure. You know, if they sound better, you're going to sell more merch, you're going to sell more beer. Which is where they're making, you know, it, it's, yeah, it, just, it doesn't make sense to me, you know. No. You know, look what happened to Amy Winehouse and other, you know, we know how many stories and that, that happens to, you know. Right, yeah. You know, but, uh, so going back to Pete, the first gig I did with him, I think you were on this one. It was the, uh, the Davy County Bluegrass Festival. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so you yeah, you you and I rode down together and we're like, you know, so we're coming from Fort Lauderdale and we're like, Davy, you know, and if you if anyone who's been in Fort Lauderdale, it's not the quote unquote south. It's Fort Lauderdale. It's where everyone goes to live for the winter and and come down and party. So it's not people who are southern. They're Floridians. They're not southern. So then so like we're like driving, like where the fuck are we going? Like we've never been to Davy. I mean, we're we're not, fr- you know. So we get there, and like as soon as we cross like the the city line, everyone had cowboy hats, and we're like, what the fuck? And I'm like putting my hair, my long hair, in a, inside my baseball cap because I don't want us yep. to get pulled over, and you know. Yep. And uh, yeah, Yumi and Glenn, and it was Yumi and Glenn, and I think was it Margo that was on that one with us? Might have been, yeah. So we're all driving down, and we're like, "What the fuck?" I mean, you know, w- none of us were rubes, really, and right. like, oh my god, this is the fucking South. <laughs> like, hey, what we got here is. <laughs> A communication problem. <laughs> How many raw eggs can you eat, boy? I mean, it was like, we were like, what the fuck? And ding, then ding, we go, ding, 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 yeah, ding, ding. like, you know, oh, gee, this is why the Bluegrass Festival's in fucking Davie. Yeah. You know, and of course, filled with religious people. And my first, to tie it all together, my first um, professional roadie gig was with Striper. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he's like, Mike. I'm like, what? Mike, how's it going? He comes up to me. He's talking, you know, Michael Sweet is talking to me like he's known me for fucking 10 years. Blah, 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 blah. We're in the bathroom. I'm like, dude, what are you talking about? (laughs) Yeah. He's like, oh, shit. He goes, I'm like, hi, my name is Vince. How you doing? He's like, holy shit. You look just like this dude, Mike. Just like him. You're a spitting image. I swear to God. I'm like, well, apparently, because you're talking to me like them, you know. So, and then that was the, um, uh, during soundcheck, they didn't have anyone in the room. And it was like a 6,000 seater. And because I had made friends with Michael earlier in the day, they needed a front curtain put up. And they said, well, bring Vince out. You know, because I told him that we covered a couple striper tunes in the band, you know, da-da-da-da, and practice and stuff. So I'm doing the thing, the front curtain, the black curtain, all around the stage. And they're sound checking to hell with the devil. And he's like, hey, come on up. I'm like, what? <laughs> he's like, come on up and sing it with us. I'm like, get the fuck out of here, you know? <laughs> so here I am, right? Alone in this room, singing with like the top MTV music video band. I'm an atheist. They're totally fucking Christian. They don't give a shit. Yeah. I don't give a shit because they're a great fucking band. I don't yeah. care what anyone said. I'd work for them, you know, whatever. And uh, <clears throat> all my friends are outside the building listening, and they don't know it's me. <laughs> and I'm in a band. Do you know I was like, what? The? You know, there's like 16 different directions getting pulled in. So anyway, so over the years, boom. Hey, Mike. What? <laughs> like, dude, I'd be in Atlanta. Hey, Mike. I'd be in Frisco. Mike. You know, I'm like, what the fuck? And it was all like music gigs. 
you know, music video yeah. or if I was, you know, flying in to do something, you know, consult on a fucking tour or whatever. Mike! I'm like, who the <laughs> fuck is this Mike guy? Right? You. Yeah, so then one day, I'm at a party on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. And the way that you found the party, it said, look for the projection on the side of a building. And they had a porn projected on like an eight-story building on Sunset Strip. So I'm like, wow. well, that's where we follow the projector stream, right? So we pull in there, da 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 all this other stuff. And I get a tap on my shoulder, and it's my buddy Peter going, Peter had a great card. It said, Peter Flanagan, human being. You know, everyone hold, you know, flipped the business card everywhere you went. And this is like human being. And uh, so he's like, Vince, dude, you're not, you're doppelganger. I'm like, what? And I looked and he's walking in. I'm like, get the fuck. And he looks at me and he's like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> right. So we literally walk up to each other like it's some weird like 1950s movie, you know, where like there's, you know, the two people dress differently, but they look the same. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He goes, Vince. I go, Mike. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because That's apparently hilarious. the same shit has been happening to him anytime there was a movie or a film crew on their tour Vince Vince you know because I was on the film side and TV side and music videos and stuff so like he was getting called Vince I was getting called Mike and we That's literally hilarious. we had like a, a, a I don't even know if it was a five minute conversation because we were that weirded out yeah. Like, we're like, hey, at least we finally know who we, you know, we've met. You know, mm-hmm. this is this is too weird, man. No offense. And we're both like, yeah, none taken, you know. <laughs> that was funny. That's hilarious. Exactly. Mike. Right. Mike. Vince. But, yeah. Uh, midnight Mass. I don't know. How many times have you uh, had to w- wake up as a kid and go to Midnight Mass? Never. Oh, you didn't do that for Christmas Eve? No, well, I think I made maybe twice. But uh, I haven't had to do it until um, I moved out here to Long Island because uh, Rose is Catholic and she likes to go to Midnight Mass for Easter and does do the um, candlelight vigil and stuff like that. It's yeah. not technically midnight. It's more like 10 p.m. Right. Right. But still, is uh, yeah, the candlelight vigil. Yeah, we stopped doing midnight mass when mom and dad got divorced. So I oh yeah yeah. So I think I remember doing it one or twenty, you know, five six years old. Yeah, but well, yeah, they never uh, they never preached to us like that. That's for sure. Right. You know, they never you know quoted Revelation scripture to us like that. Yeah, and I think the other thing they really did a good job on, and they didn't make it into a. Hey, both, how you doing kind of thing. Because usually when they put in the quote unquote token whatever, mm-hmm. it's totally disingenuous and insulting. Yeah. Like, hey, yeah. we're gonna we're gonna be diverse and we're gonna cast a Muslim. And his <laughs> name's gonna be Ali and he's gonna be a nice feller. <laughs> nice you know, feller. You know, it was nothing they like that. Him off. Oh, no spoilers, Dude, but yeah. He needs an award. He he did that. And especially that scene when they are school. in when they are in the it was a school board thing. Yep, that scene was great. Like people should study and, that scene at the subtlety. And fucking Bev, man. Yeah, fucking Bev, bitch. Dude, I haven't hated what? someone on screen like that since like you know <laughs> Nurse Cratchit or something. I mean, she's really. But the funny thing is, they she nailed it. Yeah. Oh, that's why it's great. Yeah. You know, that role made her career. Like, she, oh, yeah. she's going to, you know, not that she hasn't had one, because I'm sure she constantly works, you know, probably a theater yeah, person, yeah. more or less. Even more so now. Yeah, now she's going to be, you know, hey, let's get that crazy chick from fucking, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, hopefully she's not going to be typecasting that, though. Uh, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. Just because, well, here's the other thing, you know, because she can also play smarmy nice and, like, totally void nice. True. You know, there's a whole bunch of spectrums going on there, but, you know, like, if I get to see her be evil twice more, I would applaud. Yeah. I mean, she got literally everyone I know who watched it fucking hates her. 
<laughs> Hates your character, not the actress. And what's great is that you watch an interview and she's totally a delight. She's bubbly, yeah. you know, great personality. Oh, sure. Yeah. Incredible actress. I mean, it's nice to see that, you know, and the more right. and more shows that we watch and talk about, the, there's great, really great storytelling being done in stream, yeah. in the streaming world. It seems to be the place mm-hmm. to be. And mm-hmm. uh, I think it's great if there's not another season of Midnight Mass and just leave it like that. Like, oh, yeah. It's yeah. okay to not do sequels. Like maybe we need to get to a place where we just don't do that anymore. Well, it's a money grab. You know that. You know, yeah. You know, no more reboots. I mean, next thing you know, they're going to reboot Jesus. <laughs> oh! I knew you were going to say that. Right, right. <laughs> but, uh, you know, maybe reboot Lou, reboot Moses. Uh, reboot a hippie chick oh, is after. You're writing your own sequels, aren't you? <laughs> well, reboot Lou's happening. Reboot Moses is going to happen at some point. Uh, yeah, but it's called Noah Reboot instead of Reboot Noah. It's Noah Reboot. Uh, okay. Yeah, and then I'm going to do Moses go. at some point. Uh, and, you know, the one I'm doing after um, I finish this next one is uh, Rebuta Hippie Chick. <laughs> Rebuta. Rebuta Hippie Chick. Yep. Nice. Yeah, uh, her name is April Sky, and she runs a Bud and Breakfast slash hospice uh, community. Bud and Breakfast. Yeah, Bud and Breakfast. Awake and bake. Instead of uh, Bed and Breakfast. Yeah, I get it. Right, right, right. <laughs> yes, sir. Back, get it. <laughs> Dice. And people laugh. Yeah. Back, get it. Oh. <laughs> you know, can you imagine if uh, like Moses came down from the mountain and it was someone like Dice? <laughs> All right, come on over here. <laughs> Number 10. No, oh! I, I couldn't imagine. That would just be funny. Like, what? But uh, speaking of history, Mel uh, Brooks is uh, coming out with History of the World Part 2. Yes. I saw that. Yeah. Or Part 3, he might Because the first one was called Part 2, wasn't it? No. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. And it's also going to be interesting to see what they did with the Blazing Saddles in animation form. Ooh, with animals, yeah. but I think they wokeified that. But we'll see. But uh, I have been saying the world needs a little Mel Brooks right now, you know. Yep. With everything Definitely. that's going on, people are way too, um, they're wound a bit too tight. Just a little bit. Yeah. And uh, the media and social media contributes to that incredible, on an incredible level. People feed on that. Yeah. You know what? Turn it off. I mean, I go on there and I post a bunch of shit and I leave. Yeah. And I keep my PMs open for you, Jay, you know, Leon, a couple other people. You know, that's how I communicate. I don't, you know, Facebook has just gotten so, I don't know. I wish people were nicer, you know. Oh, like, totally. You know, like people talking about, oh, blah, 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 I read an article, blah, 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 blah. Like, dude, I did people this. Are, I did this job for like ten racist. years. Why well, know better? Because I read an article and boom, 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 boom. okay, yeah, okay. It's crazy, dude. I don't get it. People are afraid to say they love each other. Yeah. Hey, Rob. I love you, man. Love you, brother. See how easy it is, folks. Love your friends. Yeah. Plain and, and simple. And I'm not gay. Yeah, me neither. He's my brother from another mother. Apes, you fucking lily. And if you can't tell your friends you love them, then they're not your friends, you know? That's true. Even if they get, like, weirded out. Yeah. But, you know. Like, Leon's probably sitting somewhere, you know, uh, uh, rubbed up in Vaseline and cellophane. <laughs> Turning the volume down on his phone somewhere. <laughs> shit, 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 shit! No, no. We love you, Leon. He sent me his... Uh, love you, Leon. He sent me his um, book today, and it's um, reading it in about 12 pages in, and it's very good. Yeah, wait until you get about page 50 because he really, his uh, grammar, it, it, he goes off on tangent. I, I hate to say that, but it just, uh, and, and I and I expressed that to him. I said, dude, it's like you were all over the place. You were trying to say something. You were saying something else. Yeah. And your grammar wasn't quite right. And Yeah, it's first draft. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I told like him, that. I said, hey, man, just so you know, 
a million people start writing a book in the yes. year that, in the year that you did and 10,000 people finished. Congratulations. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, so it needs editing, but I mean, right off the it draw it draws you in, and every, anything Absolutely. after that, I mean, he he writes well. You can understand what he's saying is very, uh, you know, he has a nice choice of words, vocabulary. I, I just think it's, it's you know. in some regard he gets eh, personal too. So yeah, I mean, you'll see that, but yeah, and you know, he's coming. You know, he's coming from a different realm as well. And I told him that. Yeah, you know? I'm like, hey man, you're yeah. coming from this, and you're going to this. Prose is different. You know, just like yep. blogging is different than writing a book or writing sure. a song is different than poetry, even though poetry is lyrics. You know, there's different, you know, different things about it. But um, from what mm-hmm. I saw, I really liked it. Yeah. And yep. uh, yeah, I think he's I'm honest. glad he shared it with you. Yeah. I mean, so like, hey, I kind of let it slip a couple, of, you know, a month ago. But uh, yeah. yeah, he. Uh, well, sometimes people, you know, they don't, you know. Sometimes they're um, afraid to show their work. True. And I find True. that a lot in the writing community. And it's not a, a bash against anyone. Um, me, right. I've always been, okay, let's, how do we make this better? Like, if you have criticism, yeah. great. You know, okay, let me know so I can change it. You yeah. know, or make things yeah. flow better or whatever. You know, but, uh, you know, criticism is good. You know, as long mm-hmm. as it's not mean because there's no reason for it to be that way. But, uh, right, yeah. you know, it drew me in, and he's making some revelations in there, like you making your stuff that are pretty heavy. Yeah. You know, so, you know, and that, just putting that down on paper for anyone who does that, you included, that's a huge yep. accomplishment. You know, just being yeah, able it, to it, it, put it out there and say, hey, you know. It's a huge weight off your shoulders to yeah it's great there let yourself out there and yeah it's therapy and it's just um you want somebody to let you know that it's okay yeah and so and and that's the therapy right there it's just like i'm, I'm putting myself out there I'm not sure where it's gonna go and then when when you get the feedback we're like dude look where you are now Right. Because it's the stuff that I've, you know, exposed to you when I was, you know, growing up and everything like that, and my formative years, and then here, here I am, you know, living a dream in Manhattan, you know, working in financial district, and you know, I got a, I got a house in a, a tropical paradise, and it's just wow. And he's not talking you know, Davy, Florida people. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it's kind of like you know it, it, you you um yeah you really um got to step back and see where people have come from and, right exactly i mean that's why i have such a huge problem with this movement that's been right. going on you that you know oh toxic masculinity oh hold up there's also a thing called toxic femininity and yes. if all you come at with someone is hate, you're not the solution to what's going on. Absolutely. All the dudes that I'm friends with, you know, they're manly men. And I'm not discounting, you know, and I have gay friends who are manly men. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, but all my friends legit, hey, dude, are you okay? Yes. Boom. And we'll talk about like way serious shit and are willing to expose it. Without a blink of an eye. Yeah. So that narrative to me is total bullshit. Right. You know, I'm tired of getting preached to when I haven't done a goddamn thing because I'm a feminist raised by one, a real one, not one who wanted Equality Plus. Yeah. You know, and, you know, hey, I'm all for everything being equal. Equality of outcome, that'll never happen because that's a, a sweat equity thing. Yeah. And, you know, it just, it, it just, you know, it, that will never work. And in, in my opinion, but, you know, I could be wrong. What do I know? Man, what do we know? What do we know? You just know? living a dream. Yeah. Living a dream. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Becky. Was it Becky? Was it Becky? <laughs> the, with, so, through the yeah. phone? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nightmare on Elm Street. Yep. Okay, since we're talking about church, and uh, Halloween's the high holiday for me, 
um, as far as it's just my favorite holiday. Um, yeah. What What are your favorite um, scary movies? Um, you know what? I hate The Exorcist. Ooh, that's a good but, one. I was just going to say, let's but, talk but, about The Exorcist. But I love The Exorcist. And the reason why I love The Exorcist, and there, it, this is a, it's just, there's a story behind it. Yeah. Um, when I was 12 fucking years creepy. Old, I, <laughs> I went to go visit with my cousin, who yeah. was six years, six, six months older than I am. We went to go stay with my mom down in Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. And her and her boyfriend... They went out for the night, and this was when HBO just started coming out, yeah. or just came out. And Exorcist was one of their prime time movies at the time. And she said, "Whatever you do, don't be watching The Exorcist." And I'm like, "Really? Did you just say that?" So of course, my my cousin, he's sitting out there watching the movie, and I'm like, "I I I I don't like that subject matter. I it just." bothers me i didn't want to see anything about it so i stood in the or i sat in a bedroom listened to tunes listened to barry manilow and um i write I the ju- song <laughs> i just happened to open up the door for like two seconds like two inches <laughs> and that's exactly when she turned her head yeah. and said, do you know what she did to me or you know i'm just like Whoa! So Yo I, mama's up top in hell. <laughs> I freaked out. I'm just like, whoa. Right. So I was talking to my other cousin, my cousin's brother, and he says the best way to um, face your fears is uh, stand up to your fears. Yeah. So I ended up going out. And, and at the time, I, for, for a little snapshot, okay, for at the time, we were used to, like, the biggest thing that, you know, probably we both watched was, do you know how to tie your shoes? <laughs> Pretty much. Sure you And do. that was scary in itself. Yeah. <laughs> Let me teach you how to tie your shoes. So I went out and bought the book, bought The Exorcist. So I read it from cover to cover, and I understood everything that was going on in the book with the archaeology and the whole yeah. um, context that he found and everything like that. So I understood yeah. exactly what how, how the movie went through. So then I could actually sit down and watched the movie and it, it was still fucked up. I still kind of like, wow, that is fucked up. Mm-hmm. But, um, just to see the visual come to life, um, that you read about in the book yeah, and it just like, uh, you know, when she levitates and pisses her pants and stuff like that, and you're, mm-hmm. you're just like, Whoa, I've been to parties like up. that. How about you? But, huh? I've been to parties like that. <laughs> <laughs> not lately yeah i wasn't but, pissing my know, pants i but, faced yeah. my fears and yeah. i can actually watch that movie and then they when they came out with the director's cut where um the russian gymnast came down with and she did the crab block down the stairs and stuff yeah that part was actually um deleted from the movie the original movie the, re, the original release yeah so when the um director's cut came out and i watched that i'm just like wow that is fucked up yeah, there's some so interesting just, things that happen on that movie for sure. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, like but, um, um, when I worked at the effects company, Linda Blair would come in all the time because she knew someone who worked in the shop. So Linda would like... <laughs> I'm sure. she would pop in, you know, like, hey, what's going Dude, she was like the coolest chick. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. You know, totally no pretense, you know, all the bullshit. You know, she would tell us stories about... I'm like, tell me some bullshit. And, she, and you'd be like, what? Yeah. You yeah. know, it's just amazing what, you know, some women had to put up with. But, uh, oh, yeah. 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 Um, the Exorcist, what made it, you know what made it so creepy? The actual background audio of the demon shit. Oh, yeah. Is oh, from. Yeah. The backward masking. Is from the actual Exorcist case that it's based off of. Oh, yeah. So that's the person who was actually, quote, unquote, possessed. Oh, wow. With the demon voice coming out of it. Oh, yeah. You know, not like the main vocal, but the shit in the right. background, like, where's your mother? I'm fucking, where's your mother? Yeah. Your mother so sucks in hell. <laughs> your mother so sucks in hell. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that, that, uh, uh, Halloween movies? Yeah, that would, that's probably got to be it right there. Yeah. Other than that, I'm kind of like, uh, I'd have to go oh. with the great pumpkin, Charlie Brown. Nice. Nice. What you know? One of the, one of my favorite scaries 
is the Omen from when I was a kid. Oh yeah, dude, Damien, that little fucking evil fucker, man. Oh my god, it was it was I a great they movie. Made an Omen three too, didn't they? Yeah, where, where he became he was, president, uh, like a teenager or an adult. Well, yeah, um, uh, Sam Her- uh, Sam Her- not Sam Her- Who's the dude from? Um, no, I know what you're talking. About. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yep. yep. Uh, the dude from Jurassic Park. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So he played Damien, who became who was a senator, who became president. Yes. Yep. Which basically mm-hmm. they just ripped off the um, Lex Luthor story from the Superman comics. But you know, anyway, um, Sam Neil. Yes. Thank you. And, uh, you know, that was pretty creepy. The second one was creepy. Yeah. You know, he just gave yeah. that look, and you hear the, oh, look, there's the, every, dude, every time I saw a Doberman for, like, the next 10 years, this is what I, <laughs> oh, yeah. this is what I heard in my <laughs> mind. <laughs> uh, you know, fuck. The hound from hell. Yeah, and Dobermans are good dogs, you know. Yeah. You know, same shit with, like, Rottweilers and Pits. That, that's the yep. fucking Doberman <laughs> and the German Shepherd of today, you know. Oh yeah, they yep. really are sweet dogs. They are, yep. But yeah, the Omen totally freaked me out. Yep. But uh, and my favorite animated, well, Great Pumpkin is up there, of course. But uh, um, what was it? Um, Party on Monster? Uh, or no, it was called Monster Island, and it was like a claymation thing of all like the classic monsters, and they performed the Monster Mash at the end of it. Oh, okay. I don't. I, I never saw that one. Yeah, that was my. That was my one of my favorites. The Island of Doctor Moreau. Oh, that was a great movie, for the yeah. time, you know. That's what I thought you were gonna say. Oh man, that oh oh, you know what else fucking freaked me out as a kid? Salem's Lot with that fucking floating kid. There you oh, go, yeah. Rhonda. That fucking floating kid. My mom used to take us to the drive-in to see all those movies. And I'm just like, I, I mean, half of these movies I don't remember the names of them. Yeah. But then, what, you know, when you when you mention Salem's Lot, I'm sure there's other movies that you've seen back in the '70s. I'm just like, oh yeah, my mom took us to the drive-in for that movie. Right. She loved her horror movies. I'd never realized that. Mm-hmm. Well, horror movies right. when we were teenagers were great to go to because you take a girl and she gets scared and grab onto you. Oh yeah. You know, and that's when uh, Andrew would put the old arm around the shoulder. <laughs> hey, baby, what's going on? We want some popcorn. Yeah, yeah. It's extra Wait butter. <laughs> I went all out. I even put salt on it. Wow. Yeah. No charge. <laughs> no charge. I can that's hook you up. Awesome. Even got free napkins. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, it's a, yeah, Salem's Lot, that floating kid fucking just fucked with my head. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, the trilogy, the trilogy of horror was what the, uh, um, Karen Black movie was that freaked the shit out. Oh, yeah. Those things crawling oh, up saw, the side of the fucking house. Oh, my God. Yeah, we saw that. We saw, um, Satan's Cheerleaders. No, oh, nice. Um, what was the one where, shit, I read the book. But um, she gave birth to a robot or something like that. Hmm. It, it, it was messed up, but I, I can't remember the name of the movie. But I, get, I read the book, and it was like, <laughs> I can't believe that. She I, gave birth like, to a robot? Is... I didn't know dildos could get people pregnant. Oh! Right? <laughs> Holy moly. I can't. Right. I don't remember that one. Yeah, I, I forget the name of it, but uh, it was messed up. Yeah, my favorite cheesy Halloween movie of all time is uh, Basket Case. Okay. <laughs> I never saw that, but I've heard of it. Yeah, I, I forget what the lead got. Let's just call him Ronald. Ronald okay. was Ronald. Hey, Ronald. Yeah. Ronald was born to twi- a twin, <laughs> but his twin never saw the light of day. And like he's like this, you know, he's attached to his side, and he's holding him like in a basket, and this thing fucking kills everybody. It's pretty funny. Yep, yep. Yeah, there is um, some. Uh, what are... was the one with the um, demon seed? That's what it was. Demon, demon seed? seed. Nice. That nice. was the name of it. Rosemary's baby. That was another one. Kind of. Uh, that was that, that was messed based. up. Yeah, Roman Polanski directing. 
Mm-hmm, the pervert. Yeah. But then again, you know, Mia Farrow and Woody Allen, the gold figure. Yeah. Just have sex with the devil. All you got to do is have sex with the devil. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. <clears throat> yeah. But, uh, yeah, what are some other uh, um, church-related, uh, like, well, The Exorcist. Now, did you watch the later Exorcists? Yeah, The Heretic. Ooh. Yeah, I, I really li- thought it was interesting that they released two different versions in, like, the same year. By two different yeah. film, I thought that was really cool. I I enjoyed that, you know, because that's not really a horror movie. It's it's a no. more of a thriller scare. Yeah, you know what I mean. I prefer the thinking, scary right. movies. Yep. You know, psychological. Yeah, and like now stuff has just gotten like so over the top, ridiculously bloody. Yeah, gore. Yeah, I mean that's fine in certain instances, you know, and if they're doing it for comedic effect, it's even better. But uh, right, because you can just go way over the top. But, uh, right. you know, I did watch Halloween Kills. I haven't got a chance to see that yet, but I want to watch it. Gotcha, gotcha. <clears throat> I will not. And then you got all the um, Friday the 13th and yep. uh, Freddy. Yep. You're so on prime time always... now, bitch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, those are all uh, classics. Yeah, I used to hang out with um, Ricky. He was the dude in the wheelchair in Elm Street 2. Oh, no shit. Yeah, we used to jam together, me, Topel, and uh, Ricky, and because Topel was really good friends with him. And uh, he was also the Pizza Hut Bigfoot guy. Bigfoot! Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dude, the guy was fucking great, man. Played bass. Really good guy. I forgot guy. about that. Yeah. But, uh, That's too funny. Yeah, um, and the, you know, I mean, I had Freddy Krueger's glove on my desk for like five years. It was one of the five, you know, because we our shop did all the original Friday the Thirteenth and Elm Streets. That's awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, that was one. Of, I, you know, I should have just like accidentally took it home one day, but I just, you know what I mean. Yeah. But and it was just like laying there in like a fucking the rental department of an effect shop. It wasn't like behind glass or nothing like it would be today. You know. Oh yeah. Yeah. In the Smithsonian. Yeah, we also made the uh, gyroscopes for um, Lawnmower Man. It's Euro. 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 <laughs> Don't you know that you're my Euro? Euroscopes. <laughs> Shit. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's really interesting because you can scare. It's really fun. It, I think it's more of a fun scare. With religious atta- with uh, religion attached. I agree. Yeah, yeah. Because if there's that extra something history. spooky, whatever, whatever. However you grew up, there's that extra yeah, something the supernatural. Yeah, you know, like it always pissed me off that you just had these boogeymen who just fucking walk everywhere, and you're like booking, like I said in the last one, you're fucking swinging <laughs> on a rope, going over, you know, and they're still walking ten feet behind you. Yeah. You know that's bullshit. But uh, uh what was the one with uh, Val Kilmer? Um, that had to do something with the church. Oh, the saint? Where he played the no, saint? not the saint. Um, maybe I'm thinking of a different movie, but, uh, oh, uh, shoot, uh, Stigmata. Oh. Yeah. That was, that was a religious mm-hmm. connotations. Stigmata. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. that's freaky. That was a good one. Wasn't that with uh, Jennifer Jason Lee? I think so. And that was where they had uh, the Virgin Mary with uh, tears coming out. Or, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, tears of blood. Yeah, Hellboy was another good one. That was oh, more yeah. action. But, uh, um, yeah, you know, Jennifer Jason Lee, she was like, she was white hot for a moment. Yeah. And that's not a racist term. Um, <laughs> so she was like, you know, and, and all the great shit, and then she disappears for tw- 15 years. Right. That's just, you know, she, maybe she started a family or something and did that, but, you know, and that's not sexist. That's a guess. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? It was, like, it was weird because, oh, here's this interesting actress who's like, different than everybody, and then where the hell'd she go? Yeah. 
you know, like. Well, she was the mother on Atypical. Oh, okay, yeah. That show that yeah. you keep on telling me to watch. I've watched two episodes yet. <laughs> I love that show. Yeah, and Rappaport's the dad, right? Yes, yep. yeah. Yeah, that guy's fucking great. You know what I mean? What the fuck? <laughs> you know what? You fucking jag off sitting there with like a fucking asshole. You know, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, he's good. And it's, you know, his rants during yep. the uh, coup were pretty funny. Yes. But, uh, yeah, he's always been good, though. Yep. You know. I agree. Um, you know, it's, what's another religious, you know, I mean, shit, you can go on, you can go to Conan, you know, different religions, blah, blah, blah. But, uh, oh, man, what shit, there's one. Ooh. What was it? Um, the Seventh Sign? I was just thinking of something seven, dude. But yes, with, with the Demi lo- Moore Lucas and everything like that. Yeah, man, dude. That I've I've probably watched that movie 150 times. Yeah, that is my good. favorite, like thriller, spooky, because it's not really horror. It's just like re- influenced by religion. Right. It's yep. a different level of something that you know you may not get it as much if as if you grew up Catholic or mm-hmm. deeply religious family. If you were, you know. But it, it, dude, that movie, amazing. Yeah. The seventh. Oh, wait, no, the seventh seal. Yes, that's what it is. Yeah, that was really good. Probably, I would Demi Moore's one. You know, probably one of her top performances. I think. Yep. Like, next to GI Jane. I knew you were gonna say that. <laughs> and that's not from a physical standpoint. I mean, that was a total bonus. But she, she was really good in that movie. She was. Yeah. Demi Demi Moore. <laughs> Demi Moore, Demi Moore, that, Demi Moore. Was it love at that, first sight? That that damn Ashton Kutcher. Yeah. <laughs> Good for him. Good for her. Right. You right. know, whatever, you know, hey. Now Doesn't she's matter. With, now he's with Mila Kunis. Age is relative. Yeah. She's a, yeah, she's good too. She's done some stuff lately that uh I, Yeah. You know, and her comedy stuff is solid, so. Yes. You know, I'm and she came in like fresh right into that show from nothing. Right. I don't yeah. mean from nothing, but you know, she didn't have experience for those people right. who are waiting to get triggered. <laughs> you know, she was just, you know, she was just, you know, she was a, a fresh one and she, yeah. you know, she did great. She's got great comedic timing. Absolutely. But uh, and then we had the monsters. Oh, the Adams family is what we didn't talk about last time. Oh yeah, Adams family show. <laughs> you <rain. laughs> dude. That guy narrated like all the cartoons and like most of the movies we saw during grammar school. Awesome. Yeah, the one-eyed be- the one-eyed Minnesota beaver. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I can't wait for Rob Zombie's uh, Adam's family or uh, the Munsters. Yeah, they posted the first cast photo the other yeah, day. Yeah, I saw that with people in makeup. I, I Herman looked familiar. I just couldn't make it, and I didn't read it. I was like, "Oh, that's cool." Yeah, but because um, Sherry uh, Sherry Moon is playing uh, Lily. Yeah, Lily. Yeah, Lily. Yeah, Lily. Hey, Hyman. <laughs> hey, Hyman. <laughs> hey, Hyman. <laughs> Go downstairs and fill up the beaker. <laughs> darn, 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 darn. <laughs> we started watching that, uh, the old seasons, and, um, and that's another um, Dude, Gwen was television awesome, show man. that her mom likes. Yeah. And she'll sit there, she'll laugh, she'll giggle. Attention and car 54. Attention car 54. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the Love Potion episode is hilarious. Oh, hell yeah, dude. That whole show was great. Hi, man. You know? <laughs> yeah. And it was really well written. And Absolutely. it's like, hey, most of these fucking people don't know that we're making fun of racism. In like a huge fucking way, and so everyone's like, "Oh Whoop. yeah, when well, they went to that costume party, yeah." Just the whole like, thing. They're the freaks in the neighborhood. They're the ones who look different. You know, they're the yeah, 
Mm-hmm. You know, and like, oh, and the and the uh, the embarrassment of the family, Marilyn being all regular. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Right. Regular nineteen fifties blonde Marilyn Monroe look alike, but you know, regular. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that was a great show. And then, and uh, what? Only three seasons, though, wasn't it? Yeah, well, it didn't last for long. It just ran it forever on reruns. Yeah. And then there was like, uh, what was it? Frankenstein, the giant robot? Was another... Frankenstein. What was it? Frankenstein. Oh, yeah. Frankenstein. Here, walk this way. <laughs> Here. Where did you get this brain? What's, what did it say? Abby, someone? Abby, what? <laughs> Abby normal? I put an abnormal brain in an eight foot monster. That, that's some class acting right there. Yeah, totally. Put the candle back. <laughs> Frau Bluka. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there you go. That's another Halloween movie. Yeah, for sure. Mel Brooks. Yeah. Uh, you think I'm going to try to get Phyllis on for that one? Oh, yeah. Yeah. There you go. She's fucking hilarious. So that would be fun yep. to do. It. Mel oh, that Brooks. would be awesome. Yeah. Young Frankenstein. I had that poster hanging up in my room for like my whole childhood. And, and, and I think I'd even went to the dorm room. It was on the wall. Young Frankenstein. Oh, yeah. yeah. What a great movie. Mm-hmm. It's Frankenstein. <laughs> mm-hmm. Nice grouping. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> classic. Would you like some coffee before you do it? No. Brandy? Brandy? No. Thank you. Tea? No. Thank you very much. Oval tea? That would be enough. Yeah. Oh my God. That was what a great that movie. That's hilarious. Holy shit. Uh huh. Yeah. Cloris Leach and she's awesome. Oh, she was the best ever. <laughs> Her and Madeline Con- Mel Brooks just cast comedy perfectly. Oh, I know. You know. Yeah. Definitely. But uh, yeah. Oval tea. Oval tea. No. <laughs> Uh, what knockers? Yeah. Thank you, doctor. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Shit. Uh, when fashion like hits. Hey? Yeah. When fashion hits. <laughs> <my lottery! laughs> Looking like a million dollar dandy. So <laughs> Shit. Oh, oh my man. God, man. All day. All day. Dude, that whole movie just topped to, you know. <laughs> Here, have some tea. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my oh, God, man. dude. That movie is just so fucking funny. Yep. Let's see who else. Okay. Uh, vampires. Oh, there's the count. One, two, three disasters. Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> right? They had a count. Uh, mummy? Was there like a mummy anywhere? I don't. I don't remember like in the show about a mummy. Invisible Man. Oh yeah, yeah. There's a few renders. I I haven't seen the most recent one. Invisible Man story. I kind of always like, but I haven't seen the recent one with the chick from uh, the woman. Shit, she was well, in. Was she was in Mad was- Men, and then she did. Uh, the one that was that came out like a year and a half ago or last year? Yes, correct. Yeah, I saw that. That was pretty good. Yeah. Did it stay close I don't think to it the was the same take on the original Invisible Man? Gotcha. Maybe it was, but uh you know, I it, it uh that was messed up. It was kinda like a The Invisible uh, Gender. He had a suit that was you know, basically made of mirrors or something like that. Oh, that's interesting. So stealth technology. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. Very nice. And then she found the suit and she was able to turn it around on him. So but yeah, I mean it the movie itself was pretty good. I just don't I just don't know if it was taken from the original context of the 
Invisible Man movie. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's always been an interesting one for sure. Mm-hmm. 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 So. Right, 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 right. But, yeah. Got a condo made of stone. <laughs> Yeah, the mummy st- the mummy movie, the original, not the Tom Cruise disaster, but Brandon Brandon Fraser. Yeah, dude, those movies were so fun. You know, it's like what yeah. you know. Everyone quit taking themselves so goddamn seriously and make a fun movie, right? You know, and Doom Patrol, dude, he plays robot. He, it is oh, the yeah. best, he, dude. He's so vile and like you know, <laughs> it's hilarious, dude. The shit that comes out of his mouth is just, you know, hilarious. People, you know, like, oh, I, I could that. totally I like that. write his, you know, people would think it's me, you know, like he's, yeah. Right. Every other three words is fucking what? But <laughs> yeah, he, he's great in that. And, you know, he's got a resurgent, resurgence going on. He was always good. Right. I always liked him. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And people are like, oh, look how much weight he's gained. This, that, and the other. Oh my God. He's a, yeah, dude, he's oh, like boy. 60. Fucking relax. You know, all these people, you know, eating fucking three leaves of fucking spinach, and they're like, oh, that's it for the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wait till you hit 30. <laughs> that's when gravity kicks in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. All these youngins acting like, you know, they can't take a dump that'll make their spouse turn cross eyed when they walk in after you don't spray. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I lived that. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, what the fuck is wrong with you? What did you eat? Jesus Christ, what died up in there? <laughs> up in there? Up in there. Up in there. <laughs> ha, 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 ha. <laughs> How you doing, Pilgrim? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So most of America doesn't know that no one ate fucking turkey. <laughs> Yeah, I can't wait yeah. to do the uh, Thanksgiving one. That's going to be good. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Totally. But, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, so what, let's see, Trick or Treat, that was the movie that Ozzy uh, did a couple of tunes oh, yeah. on. That's right. King Diamond's yeah. Halloween was in there. That was pretty cool. Um, I don't know, man. There was something, like, magical about 80s horror flicks that just, Oh yeah. Know, I'm going to do an episode... On that uh, next week, I think Scotty or Rhonda's coming on for that. But oh, okay, um, you know, because they go to all the horror shows and stuff, and like Rhonda, oh makes, yeah, Rhonda from Resurrection Goods on Facebook uh, makes, yep. um, and my co-star in Woke of the Worlds coming out October thirtieth on Vaudeville Press. Sweet. Sweet, yeah, she's funny. And uh, she makes this cool stuff. You know, she basically repurposes furniture and adds a an horror element to it, you know. So, oh, okay. So you can get, like, a Victorian chair with, like, skull upholstery and, you know, some cool shit. But, yeah. Nice. Yeah, but there was something about 80s movies that were just the best cheesy, bad, horrible, great movies. Yep. You know, like, we know they sucked, so we got three of them. <laughs> You know, we'd go down to the whatever and fucking pay a buck twenty nine for you know each movie, get three of them, a case of beer, and everyone would watch like horror flicks and listen, you know, jam music and you know make one of the horror movies. You know. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Oh. Yeah, there that. was one movie I forget it was called. It wasn't Mad Max because obviously Mad Max with Mel Gibson, but uh, uh, there Whoa. was some. I believe it was actually before um, Friday the 13th. But uh, Madman Mars or something like that? Mad Cop? No, not Mad Cop. But Mad- the, the, the actual killer's name was Madman Mars, but I forget the name of the actual. Madman movie. Mars. Let's look that up. Let's see uh, what our enemies at Google have to say. <laughs> our enemies? Yeah, our enemies. Madman what? Mars. Mars. Madman Mars. Yeah. Uh, released in uh, 1981. Yeah. The plot focus, it's called Madman. 
Oh, okay. The plot focuses on an axe-wielding murderer named Madman Mars, who, after accidentally summoned by a group of campers during a campfire tale, begin to stalk them. There you go. Box office, 1.3 mil. <laughs> which was probably... that was pretty good. Dude, the budget was three hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. Yeah, I can imagine. I can. You know, so add another hundred grand for marketing at the time. Boom! Yeah, it made money. Yeah. Oh, I remember this movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was like the perfect type of cheese. Yeah. You know, and I worked on one of these type of perfect type of cheese movies. <laughs> After that was uh, Evil Dead. Well, I worked on a bunch of them, but. The one I worked Sam, on Sam Raimi. on set, usually I would like we'd make the props and stuff like the exploding heads and the chopped off body, you know, the chopped off head for the body and da, 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 all this other stuff. We'd yeah. blood, smoke, everything we'd provide. Anyway, so I'm working on this one called Skinner. And oh, yeah. So Sam, yeah, so it's Sam Raimi's brother who directed Spider Man. And um, part of my job, because I was the only one who didn't fucking ask for the job. Um, What's her name? Tracy Lords was the star of the movie. Okay. Okay. And um, basically, it's it was kind of like um, um, Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. Um, that you know he basically wore a skin suit of the people that he murdered. You know, so it's kind Skinner. of yeah, Ed Gwynn, yeah. kind of based on the Ed Gwynn thing. And um, <clears throat> so I got the job of. Uh, being her security detail, basically. They're like, hey, you got to take care of Tracy. I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> you know, and everyone's like, you fucking dick! You know, because everyone's like, hey, can I can I be a... Uh, blah, 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 hey, can I be a... Blah, 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 hey, can I be a... <laughs> you know, and I didn't fucking ask. You know, it's kind of like the same exactly. shit that happened at uh, 18 and under, not admitted in Lauderdale. Uh, same shit. Yep. So they're like, hey, Vin, yeah, okay. So I did, and she turned out to be... You know, totally cool. She's married to this banker guy. Great conversationalist. Cool, totally cool person. You know, bad rap kind of a deal. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, so during the shooting of this movie, the director, Ivan Naji, was dating someone who became the pinnacle of all tabloid fodder. He was dating Heidi Fleiss when the Heidi Fleiss fucking thing went down. Oh, geez, yeah. Oh, my God. Dude, <laughs> we'd be shooting and, like, fucking all of a sudden, whoa, like a hundred fucking paparazzi. And, you know, it's like, what? Oh, boy. Dude, like, fucking weird. And we're, in like, in the worst fucking neighborhoods, you know, probably shooting unpermitted and shit, you know. <laughs> but, like, to go through that and see the strat and, like, she'd pop up on set. You know, like, the whole fucking world is looking for hiding. And she'd pop up. Hey, what's going on? You know, like, let's get you in the production trailer, you know. Shouldn't be hanging outside, Heidi. Mm-hmm. But, you know, and then to see the shit that she... Dude, that whole thing was fucking weird, you know? Yeah. Totally bizarre. But, uh, yeah, talk about your horror show. Fuck. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah, dude, I was, like, getting paid, like, $50 a day. It was, like, you know, my first horror flick. You know, and I'm like, fucking what? You know, just like landed in the center of the OJ thing, landed in the center of fucking Northridge earthquake, center of LA riots. You know, so when I go yeah. somewhere, oh, I yeah. like to experience what they have to offer in all shapes and forms. You know, there you go. But uh, yeah, so uh, okay, so at the end of the day, uh, midnight mass, eleven cups out of twelve for me. Rob gives it ten out of twelve. Yes, sir. And uh, you know. Uh, eventually, we're going to get around to uh, reviewing another show, and Rob can tell you all about that. Which one? We talked about a couple. Well, what do you mean, which one? Yeah, we we're not going to do Dope Sick. We're going to do Dope Sick after, <laughs> after a certain kind of dogs. Reservation dog, dogs. Yes. That show is fucking hilarious. I can't wait to talk about that show. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, you know, Indian um, refer- I, well, references. <laughs> can't believe I said that. But, yeah, um, there's a lot of, um, you can see where the stereotypes come from, that's for sure. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, and we're not being insensitive. There's 
a truth to all stereotypes, even there you is? Know, yeah, for white people, for black people, Asians, you know, there's there's just some things that hold true, and that's not racist. That's you know, like I'm Bohemian, you know. So yeah, yeah. if I don't have to buy something, I can fix it with duct tape. That's what I do. It, you know, there you go. it's not a thing. You know, it's just yeah. you know. But um, it's also very well written, and it's actually written like a real comedy. It's not kissing yes. your ass. It's funny. It's brutally funny because. Comedy hurts That's sometimes, sure. and it's fucking, I mean, you know, what the way that he was, you know, we'll get into that, but the way that he was able to tell the the period of the sentence and the yes. way that he did it was very, um, I don't, um, it's done in a way that not a lot of people could do, and I totally yeah. applaud the dude for writing it the way that he did. And I'll save the rest yeah. of it for the podcast. But There you go. Yeah, and it's a great cast as well. Definitely. Because you know what? A lot of people, they go on and they just want to bitch about shows that they watch. That's not what we do. No. We, we want to talk about stuff that we like and stuff that's good. You know, because why waste your money bitching about something? You know? <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah, get it. It was, was a good series. And the funny thing is it's just... You, Hey, I know that person. Hey, even Rose. She, I mean, she loves. Uh, um, what are the? What is it? What is the uh, rap group? Not not Stenjati, but. Um, Wait, Mike, don't. Tribe called Red. Funny Mike. Funny Bone and uh, Little Mike. Funny Bone and. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. The two the two guys on the bikes. Yeah. Dude. <laughs> weren't they at Weren't they at Nam when we were there? Yeah. Okay. No, no. That was a year before, but... Uh, Dude, I remember yeah, meeting they, them for somewhere, you know, like just in passing, you know, that was a fucking trip, you know, because they I are they just... Were. I, I missed that, but uh, they could have been, yeah. They are just like they are in the show. Yes, absolutely. I'm, there's no acting, really. I mean, you know what I mean? <laughs> Not really. There is, but there isn't, you know. Yeah. But yeah, Gary Farmer... Uh, Wes Duty. Oh, yeah, and Wes, um, who played a werewolf in season th- three of... Oh, man. oh, that was a really good show, and I forgot what it was. I know. I know what you're talking about, too, and I, I forget, too. Oh, man. Yeah, really... you turned me on to that one, too. Yeah, that was a really good show, man. Oh, um, Penny... Penny, Penny Dreadful. Dreadful. Yeah, and what makes that show really great, like um, Midnight Mass... Is that guy wrote every episode of that show, all ten episodes? Oh yeah. So, season one, he had never written for a TV show before. He was totally new, and they let him write all ten episodes. Yeah. And it just goes to show you, if you have an idea, man, and you, you don't need twenty-two episodes to make your point. Correct. You know, people are going to talk about it no matter how long the story is. You know, but uh, when it all comes down to it, you know, it's just creativity talking. Oh, (laughs) no, shameless plug. (laughs) Right. Available on vaudevillepress.com, Spotify, and wherever you get your favorite podcast. There you go. Absolutely. But uh, yeah, so this is, uh, yeah. uh, uh 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 (laughs) So did you uh, have any cocktails today? I, uh, I had a little bit of a Punta Cana rum. Nice. Uh, and uh, I had just finished a cigar when uh, you called. And what type of cigar was that? You know what? I didn't even look at the label. I just grabbed it and said, like, oh, okay, I think I'm smoking this tonight. Make one up. Oh, uh, a Nicaraguan. There you go. With a Dominican cover, uh, leaf. And those are available widely? Absolutely. <laughs> this is what we're doing. We're trying to be a man show and talk about man stuff. And hey, if we want sponsors, Jason is the pipe and beer guy. Rob is the cigar and bourbon guy. And V here is your weed and wine guy. Today I'm what? drinking total white trash barefoot Cabernet Sauvignon. Because <laughs> you, you're allergic to Merlot. Yep. And uh, 
Oh, and I have birthday cake, um, 28% THC with the pre-rolled from the local dispensary, who we hope hope to have a sponsorship from soon. There you go. Yeah, so, so, hey, if you want uh, guys in their 50s to represent your product and you don't mind comedy and being slightly offensive, all in good humor. We'd love to have you as a sponsor if it's pipe tobacco, if it's recreational marijuana, wine, bourbon, cigars. We're here for you. <laughs> because uh, you don't really have that many places to market, and we'd love to help you out because uh, what do guys do when they relax and talk with each other? This is what they do. Shoot the shit, yeah. You know, it's okay. And uh, at the end of the day, People need to have conversation, and if you can't have conversations like this on the regular, well, uh, you should look for them. You should. You know, all this show is really, when I have Rob and Jason on, is what we would talk about normally. It's nothing different. True. You know? Yep. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know. Okay, so uh, I'm going to wrap this up, and uh, Rob, hang on for a moment. All right. So everybody, thank you. Uh, we'll be back Tomorrow night for um, Saturday night with the Vag. <laughs> and if Rob can show up, he's more than welcome. If he has other things going, are you shooting? Uh, are you shooting any shows tomorrow? I don't believe I am. All right. I just well, may make a special appearance. Well, yeah. I um, mean, you know, if you don't have any uh, anything you have to attend to, um, and it doesn't get you in trouble, of course. <laughs> Sounds good. You know, always welcome. So we'll see you tomorrow night, everybody. And remember, um, when things get weird, they get funny or unfunny, and it gets really silent, but it's still really funny. That's just creativity talking. Have a good night, everybody. See you tomorrow.